Hello again, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of the Jim Cornette Experience today, where we're going to talk all about Outlaw Mud Show promoters, specifically the story of Fanboy Expo in Knoxville this past weekend, and we will review AEW's Fight for the Fallen right here on today's program, because not only me, I've watched it, but also this man has watched it. Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, the former post office playboy, because Susie's left town, Swammy's pappy, your friend and mine, the proprietor of the French Toast Chateau, he's trademarked the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim, and what a pleasure it is to be here once again for this Outlaw Mud Show edition of The Experience. And uh, I appreciate you mentioning that I watched the show at the beginning, but no one gives a crap about me watching the show. They all want to hear what you have to say. Well, but no, but we, we're both going to talk about it because, but, um, and it's not, it's not as bad as you think, folks, because I'm going to get all my venom out ahead of time because a lot of people, especially after I mentioned it on Twitter in no uncertain terms, <clears throat> a lot of people realized that I was not at the Fanboy Expo in Knoxville, Tennessee this past weekend, as I said I would be and as I tried to be. And there was no way on Twitter that we could possibly tell this story. And Brian, you've not even heard this story. Because I saved this because this is one of the goddamnedest. Now, I'm I'm not saying that this is the worst that anybody's ever been fucked over by a promoter in the wrestling business. It's not even close. I'm not saying this is the worst travel story anybody's ever had in the wrestling business. There have been people that, <clears throat> you know, was was trans, uh, stranded in Zimbabwe or whatever. So this, but this is just the stupidest, the stupidest motherfucker and the stupidest whole situation that I have ever dealt with. Now, and, and before I tell this story, Brian, uh, help me out. I, am I a punctual person? Oh, yeah. Oh, I would say very much. As a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, I called you two minutes late on Skype and you were afraid something was wrong and you were going to call the hospital. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe so. Yeah. Usually you're on time. Usually you're prompt. You're very reliable. It's very easy to work with you. I got a, a, a pretty good attention to detail, right? When, when I, I, I ask a lot of questions, I want to, I write things down. I want to make sure I'm fully versed in things. Then when, when you start talking about this technical stuff and it makes my head hurt, then I tune it out and just say, well, just do this. <laughs> right. Well, literally that just <laughs> but, happened. Yeah. But details of where I'm going, what I'm doing, I, I tend to get this and get this in advance. Right? Right. So, I know a guy, I used to know him, he don't live in the world that I live in anymore, but I used to know a guy named Tony Hunter. And for the folks who don't know, which is probably most of you, Tony Hunter, years ago in the Carolinas, he promoted independent shows. I'd worked for him a couple of times then when the, some of the first midnight reunions, when Bobby and Dennis were working over there in, in the Carolinas, and I came in a time or two. <clears throat> and and I was not aware that he had an incident in 2006 where he went underground for a while, where a lot of people needed paid, a lot of people were stranded, whatever the case. I didn't find out about this till on the internet here just a few days ago. But, but also... For the past several years, Tony, he he booked uh, uh, some guys and served as the local promoter for the big-time wrestling events when they would work down in the Carolinas, Spartanburg and Raleigh. <clears throat> and I worked there with him. And then also I've seen him a number of times over the past few years taking guys to the comic conventions. Remember when I said I wanted to stay away from the wrestling shows because the, the promoters were just screwy and I wanted to do the comic cons? <laughs> yeah. The worm has turned. I've got a couple of antidotes uh, about that. But uh, Tony's been taking people, and he would always, whenever I'd see him at one of these shows or whenever I'd have him talk to him on the phone, he'd say, oh, Fanboy Expo in Knoxville. What a great show that is. Fanboy Expo in Knoxville. My friend Dave. Me and Dave, Dave runs Fanboy Ex Expo in Knoxville, and me and him, we're just like this. You can see me holding up these two fingers through the microphone, right? <clears throat> he and Dave are just like that. And it's a great show, Corny. I took Sergeant Slaughter or so-and-so, whoever, and we did all these thousands of dollars and had all these thousands of people and everybody. It's, oh, it's just the greatest thing. You ought to come sometime. And I would say to him, well, Tony, here's the thing. Much as I don't go up and knock on the door of people's houses and ask if I can eat dinner with them, I'm sure I'd love this show, but nobody's invited me yet. Tell the guy if he wants to have me come to get in touch with me. 
<laughs> because here's another thing. I think Tony was fishing around. Well, why don't you bring me in, Tony? But I believe I've also mentioned that I rarely, if ever, and will never again after the last couple of times, use any agents. I always deal with, whether it's a wrestling show or a comic con, who's running the show? That's who I deal with. And I don't have anybody come in. And for a lot of guys, it's it's a good deal because the agent pays you a guarantee and he books you at a place. You just go and sign autographs and they keep the money, but they set the prices and they do a bunch of other shit. For me, I don't like that. I don't like people trying to charge $40 for a fucking autographed eight by 10. That's just, then what should a fucking 300 page book be? $125? The Midnight Express books are more than that, but that's a special case. Um, and also because details get lost with agents. And so normally I don't do that, but, and I have the email right here, November 27th. I confirmed this of last year with Tony Hunter because Tony called me and he said, well, corny Dave at fanboy wants to have the midnight express reunion. Cause we had just announced the first ones, right? And <clears throat> Dave wants to have, the Midnight Express reunion at Fanboy. And that sounded like a good idea because I have a plethora of merchandise. When I go to these conventions, fan fests and everything, but obviously the Midnight Express don't do this full time anymore. So I told Tony Hunter and we made this arrangement. I said, well, you tell Dave, I appreciate the invitation. And what we'll do is you just take the money that you can give to all four of us and you split it up amongst the, the boys, Bobby, Stan, and Dennis. And you give me a booth all three days and I will far exceed the guarantee on what I sell, but it don't have to come out of Dave's pockets. I'll uh, uh, cooperate with the Midnight Express photo ops and et cetera. And we'll all just have a fine time and everybody will come out ahead. <clears throat> All you need to do is cover our hotel while we're in. And, and the midnight only needed to be there on Saturday. Because I was going to be there all three days, but the midnight, the way they could come in, do the one day, and it's easier on everybody. Great deal. Great idea. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to see a bunch of old friends, go to Comic Con, the midnight reunion. Everybody's going to make money. This is going to be wonderful. And I've talked to Tony Hunter a number of times since then. We were even joking about. Uh, the crook up in Waynesboro, Virginia, Marvin Ward, Doug Ward, whatever, Doug Gibson, whatever <laughs> fucking name he's going under this week. I think he's going under federal witness protection program because <clears throat> Tony was there at the comic con in Louisville when Marvin Ward booked me on that fictitious show. He was going to run in Waynesboro with the undertaker and canceled everything. And he's got every, you know, civic authority looking for him. But anyway, so we've talked a few times earlier this year, Great times are going to be headed fanboy. And then as it starts getting closer, about a month ago, Tony calls me and says, Dave wants some pictures of the Midnight Express. I said, okay. I said, <clears throat> give me his email address, which he did, and I'll send over those pictures. And I said, Tony, when are we going to get the hotel information? Because I've presented this deal to the Midnight. I've booked this for him. I'm taking care of the details. I'm giving them the information so that way it's easier for everybody except me. And then Tony, get me the hotel information when you get it. And, uh, and then we'll go over the load in and all that stuff. I'll send Dave these pictures. So I emailed Dave the pictures. I said, let me know if you get these. Okay. If they work or if you need something else, whatever, looking forward to it. Never hear back from I've Well, people get busy. And then as everybody knows, we've had all kinds of shit going on over the last couple of weeks and it's been busy. So normally, if I don't have hotel by at least two weeks out, I'll be on the phone, right? <clears throat> but in this case, I, I dropped the ball on that, and I did not hear from Tony Hunter. And so I called Tony Hunter week before last. It was the 4th of July. And I said, Tony, I'm leaving a week from today to come to Knoxville. What's the hotel information? I got to tell the Midnight Express. Brian, do you know what an exact quote was that he said? No. Corny, if I told you now, I'd have to be making it up. <laughs> what? I said, well, well, don't do that. I said, Tony, I, I said, Stacy's in Oklahoma. Her father's passed away. We got all kinds of shit going on. I've got to leave in the morning, go to Chicago for MLW. It's going to be a 16 hour day on Saturday. It's going to be hard to get a hold of me. I'm going to be right back and I got to pick Stace up. Let's talk on Monday. And get me the hotel information and also where 
<clears throat> that because I'm bringing an entire booth of stuff where that I should go, the load in dock or a, a particular door to load in. I'll be in town on Thursday eve afternoon because normally when you do one of these big comic cons, they send you an orientation email where here's the vendor information. If you're a vendor and load in, you go where do you go to get your credentials and your passes or if you're talent, here's the green room information. Here's a contact. If you have any issues, all the fine comic con like LexCon do that. I've got nothing. I've never heard from Dave. I don't have Dave's phone number. So I said, Tony, we'll talk on Monday. Get me this information so I can get it out. <clears throat> so Monday comes. And I called Tony Hunter. I said, Tony, what's the information? Well, Dave's going to get it to you. Well, when? Oh, he's real good about that. I said, well, what about the load in, Tony? Where are we going to load in? Well, Dave's going to get you that too. All right. I'll, I'll look for Dave's email, I guess. Give me my phone number if you want. Next day, it's Tuesday now. I'm leaving on Thursday. I got nothing. So I emailed Dave at the email address that Tony Hunter's given me. Hi, Dave. Jim Cornette here. Tony Hunter tells me you're the guy that can tell me the hotel information for me and the Midnight Express for Fanboy. I've got to disseminate this information to them. And also, if you could let me know where we load in, loading dock, whatever, get our credentials. I can be in town anytime after four o'clock on Thursday. Really looking forward to it. You know what he said to me? No. Nothing, because he never emailed me back. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, Dave didn't email me back. That afternoon, Tony Hunter calls me. Corny, I got the hotel information. <sighs> Thank God. What is it, Tony? You're at the Four Points Hotel down by the convention center. I said, all right. I said, what's the street address? He said, well, I, I, I don't know. I said, never mind. I'll look it up. I said, four points by the convention center in Knoxville. You got confirmation numbers? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and he gives me a confirmation number for me, a confirmation number for Bobby, and a confirmation number for Stan. And he tells me, I've already texted Dennis his, because Tony knew Dennis from North Carolina years ago, still had the same number, blah, blah, blah. He said, I've already texted Dennis his. I said, great, that's one less thing I have to do. So I... I said, well, then what about the load-in information? And he said, well, Dave said, <laughs> you're going to hear a lot about Dave coming out. He's, Dave said, don't go to the loading dock. Well, it'll be chaos back there. Just meet, just go to the front of the convention center and he'll have some guys to help you load in. I said, wait a minute. I said, what? I'm supposed to just pull up in a fucking SUV to the front of the giant convention center. I don't know who any of these people are. I've never seen any of them. What am I supposed to just knock on the door? Hey, help me carry my, I said, why don't you meet me over there, Tony? Okay. And I figured later on we would address some thing where we actually knew where the other was going to be. Right. But I'm going to, going to meet him at the front of the convention center. He's going to help me get my shit in. All right. So I call, uh, emailed Stan, gave him the information called Doug Markham, the fine referee from uh, Tennessee, because I knew that Bobby was and Doug were going to ride over together. Doug from Nashville, Doug was helping Chad with his Heroes and Legends booth, and they're both going together, and, and Doug's going a day early because they're, they're doing a setup. So Bobby's right in there. They're getting a room that night, and then they're going to switch over to Bobby's room on Friday. So, Doug, here's the information. Okay, great. We'll see you then. So then, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I, I get all the mail orders filled, and we record the show, and I pack all the merchandise, and fold all the t-shirts, and load the truck, and get all this stuff ready. And, you know, once again, it, it's I've been rushing to do something for the past two weeks. Uh, Stace had just got home. I've been home three days. Now I'm leaving. <clears throat> but I get ready, and Thursday morning, I get in the truck. We, my travel habits have been popular lately, so let's... Let's go over this. When I get, well, the burger towel was a big hit. Oh, yeah. But when I get in my beautiful black beauty, when I get in my truck to leave on a trip, these are my habits. I have a piece of paper in my own handwriting over my visor 
that has the name, address, and confirmation number for my hotel information. The name and address of the building where the show or the meeting or the event or the taping or whatever that I'm going to be working in town is going to be held. The name and phone number of who I'm working for and any other pertinent information. <clears throat> that goes right over the visor. Then I program the address into my built-in GPS in Black Beauty. As a backup, in case I need to uh, adopt a plan B, I have a Rand McNally Road Atlas on the, on the passenger seat to the right-hand side of me. And lastly, I turn on my cell phone after taking it out of the console, plug it in so it's fully charged, and that way, if I need to be contacted or I need to contact somebody, then that can happen. And then I start to truck up, and I pull out, and I'm on the way to Knoxville. And then suddenly my phone dings. Somebody has sent me a text. Now, obviously, it's somebody who don't know who the fuck I am or has never met me or they wouldn't text me because I still think that is without doubt the stupidest fucking thing that's ever been invented. You've got a telephone in your hand. You're going to take 10 minutes to type hello with your fucking thumbs. <laughs> and instead of you call a goddamn number and say, hello, here is what you need to know. Or you get a voicemail and you leave a recording. Here is what you need to know. It's a fucking phone, right? <clears throat> but anyway, somebody sent me a text. Guess who it is? Tony. No, it's Dave. Oh. Because in my emails to him, I'd also sent him my home number and my cell phone number. And I'd also let him know that I would be leaving home on Thursday morning. Therefore, I would be home until Thursday and then I would be on the road. He texts me, and he guess what Dave said to me? What did he say? Jim, call me when you can, Dave. <laughs> he could have just called you. What the, what the fuck, right? <clears throat> so, I've, so I call Dave. I get his voicemail. I'm going to leave him a message. I can't. Voicemail full. Goodbye. What the fuck? So now I drive another 20, 30 minutes down the road. I was, I'll try him again. Voicemail. Voicemail full. Goodbye. He hangs up on me. So now I call Tony Hunter. Tony, I'm on the way to Knoxville. Dave texted me to call him. It's impossible to call him because he's not answering his phone and his voicemail is full. Is there something I need to know? I don't know, Corny. I'll try to find out. I said, well, I am four hours from Knoxville now because I was just getting out of the outskirts of town. I'm four hours from Knoxville. I'll be checking in between 3.30 and 4 o'clock at the hotel that you have provided me, and we will plan to meet about 6 o'clock to load the stuff in. If Dave needs me, I'm going to be at this phone until I get there, and then I'll call you when I check in. As you can see, I'm very precise about these things. So I drive down there and I get on 75 and there's the goddamn construction and there's the orange barrels and there's the deviated lanes. And then suddenly here comes the thunderstorm. And now there's fucking deluge and goddamn blackness in the middle of the day. And the sun is gone and you can barely see. And here comes as I'm coming around these fucking screwy makeshift lanes. I see the standing water on the left-hand side of the road. I'm in the right lane. But in the left lane is a giant 18-wheeler coming past me because he's obviously stupid instead of brave, and he's driving that fast in this weather. And I know what's going to happen when he hits that standing water. So I go all the way over on what there is of a shoulder on the right, and I tap the brakes kind of slowly because I don't want to spin out, but I slow down as much as possible. <laughs> and this truck hits that goddamn standing water, and for five full seconds, I'm going down the interstate at 35 miles an hour completely blind, totally underwater, hoping <laughs> that the lane is still the last place I left it in front of me. And I find, and then it stops raining, and then I finally get down there, and I'm, thing, I'm pulling into good old downtown Knoxville, my old hometown. Boy, I haven't seen this, these parts in a while. Can't wait to get in this hotel room, and and boy, it's going to be a great weekend. And I pull up to the Four Points Sheraton there, down by the convention center. I can see the World's Fair Ball, you know, at the uh, signifying downtown Knoxville. And I walk in. I said, hi, I'm checking in for Cornette, please. 
And the guy looks around and he looks at his thing and he said, what was that? I said, Cornette. He's looking around. He said, uh, can you spell that? I said, with a C. I said, here, as a matter of fact, I, I have a confirmation number. And I put the piece of paper right in front of him so he could type it in. He's not finding this, sir. Was this for today? I said, I said fanboy expo. Maybe it's a group. He looks at me like I've got turds hanging out of my mouth. I said, well, well, there's the, and I also had Eaton and Lane's numbers. I said, they're for Eaton and Lane. Maybe they're married. They're joined in the, he can't find Bob Eaton. He can't find Stan Lane. All these confirmation numbers are fictitious. He don't know what the fuck. I said, I'll be right back. So I go back out of the truck. I get the phone. I call Tony Hunter. I get his voicemail. Tony, I'm here at this hotel. They ain't got shit. All this stuff's fictitious. Call me back. <laughs> I go back in the hotel. I'm at, maybe the guy is, you know, something has happened where he's miraculously found this and he's got nothing for me. Tony Hunter calls back. I answer the phone. I says, excuse me, sir. I answer, I go back out the front door where I can't hear that fucking lobby music. Tony, what's the deal? And he's in the car or something. He's breaking up, right? Either that or he's doing a, the, 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 oh, that thing, right? He said, Corny, the other four points. What? I said, the other, four, where is the other four point? And the call drops. So now I'm off. Oh, so this one of these deals where there's two hotels of the same chain and they're near the convention center or whatever. <laughs> That's obviously what's happened. I go back in, walk up to this guy at the desk who now thinks I'm a complete idiot, right? And I said, so I said, I have got the answer to the whole, the solution to the whole problem. I have come to the wrong Sheraton Four Points Hotel. Can you please direct me to the other Four Points Hotel down here? Right. He looks at me like I've got steaming turds. <laughs> He gets his phone. I'm like, already this ain't good. He looks up on his phone. He said, the closest four points is Asheville, North Carolina. That's a hundred miles away. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, I said, is, is there just another Sheraton? Asheville, North Carolina. I said, I, I didn't even say I'll be right back. Right? <laughs> I said, <laughs> I, said, I <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to get more information for the record. How far is Asheville from Knoxville? hundred miles, hundred miles across the mountains. So I go back out in the parking lot and I call Tony Hunter. And this time he answers. I said, Tony, I said, what the fuck is going on here? There ain't no other four points hotel. If the next one's Asheville, North Carolina, I'm standing here in this parking lot. You've given me fictitious fucking hotel information that I had to beg you for every day for the last week and a half. I've yet to actually hear Dave's voice. He's yet to respond to any of my emails. He texts me and tell him, tells me to call him and it's impossible. I really don't have any of this on paper because you never even responded to the email that I sent you saying that this was our deal. I said, I've left my wife sitting home alone after she's just had a death in a family. I've nearly got killed on the interstate. I have driven down here on your say I have told the Midnight Express this was a good deal and given them this information that is obviously fake. And I'm going to tell, and then that's when I came out with, so, and of course it was a lot louder than this, right? And he walked, well, corn, corn, I don't, I don't, I, I, and Dave, and Dave, and it's, it, it, I, and I said, I don't, somebody, you, Dave, or somebody <laughs> in the next 10 minutes needs to call me and tell me where I'm supposed to go or I'm getting in the fucking car and I'm going back home and the clock is ticking and I hung up on him. Now, at first, this was intended to be a motivational tactic. But the more I stood there in that 90 degree parking lot in a hotel hotel parking lot that had never heard of me, I've buried myself now apparently to the Midnight Express. I have let another one of these nitwits because I've been so busy and I didn't I, I didn't fully fucking think I'm trusting another human being to do something right. 
I'm getting mad at myself. I'm realizing that this has all the earmarks of a fucking shit show and I'm, and I'm starting to vibrate. <laughs> so I decide then that really and truly, if he doesn't call me back in 10 minutes, I'm getting in the car and going home. 10 minutes goes by nothing. I get in the car, start it up, and I'm pulling out of the hotel, and I'm going down the block toward the interstate ramp. The phone rings. It's Tony Hunter. All right, I pull over to the side of this little street, and I'm like, all right, he's going to tell me now where I'm supposed to go, and I'm going to go there, and then I'm going to cuss him out and make him carry all my shit for putting me through all this, right? Yeah. And Zabona, hello. You know what he said to me, Brian? No. Corny, I can't get a hold of Dave, and I just don't know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> now, bear in mind, Tony Hunter the following day is supposed to have Sergeant Slaughter, and he was supposed to have Harley Race, but Harley got sick, and he was supposed to have the Iron Sheik. I don't know what happened to him. And he was he he did have, I think, Mick Foley, unless Mick was there on his eye. He had a number of wrestlers coming in the following day to town, including me in the Midnight Express. He couldn't give me a suggestion. He couldn't give me an option. He couldn't enlighten me anything related to this whole fucking fiasco, except he couldn't get a hold of Dave, his bosom buddy and lifelong friend. <laughs> he couldn't get a hold of Dave either. And I said, so you mean to tell me that you just want me to tootle around downtown Knoxville until when or if you can get a hold of Dave, if he does exist, where he can tell me where to fuck, I'll tell y'all where to go right now. And I fucking unleashed on him. And I said, you fucked everybody because you're a fucking moron. And in hindsight, I don't think Tony was trying to be crooked here. He, he gained nothing. I'm sure he lost. The fans got ripped off. I didn't make any money. I drove 500 miles round trip and back and paid for the gas. Nobody. So he couldn't have been crooked. Tony Hunter, you're just a complete fucking moron. And nobody should trust you if you said your shit stinks because you're a liar. So anyway, <laughs> I told Tony Hunter, I said, this is the biggest bunch of shit that I've ever heard in my life. And you have embarrassed me in front of this desk clerk guy. I got to call the Midnight Express and tell him I don't know what the fuck's going on. You, you can't find fucking Dave. You, you fucked everybody's fucking weekend. Fuck you, Tony. Everybody, my 3.2 million monthly download listeners on podcasting and YouTubing are going to hear that you and whoever this fucking Dave is are fucking morons. And the more I got myself worked up, because now I'm already on the interstate. I ended with saying, I believe if Dave was in front of me, I would assassinate him. And then I hung up. Now I got to call. So I called Doug Markham because I know he's already at the convention center because they're setting up and Bobby's ridden over with him. They've got a room for that night. They're expecting to switch over. They've only rented it for the one night. I said, Doug, this shit's gone sideways. I told him what was going on. He said, all right, I'll pass this on. I said, tell Bobby I'll miss him because Bobby's already there. I knew if Bobby was standing in front of Tony Hunter, he'd get some money out of him some way, right? <laughs> and come to find out as a sidelight, I didn't know this until later on, but Eventually, somehow Tony Hunter called Doug Markham that night and got a hold of him. And guess what he told Doug Markham? He said, I got the hotel straightened out. Just see Dave. <laughs> and Doug Markham's like, I don't know who fucking Dave is. There's a thousand people in this fucking place. Who the fuck is Dave? Right? Although Doug's not that nasty, but you know, he's, I don't know who Dave is. So but they got him in a hotel room though on Friday. It was a, fucking place called the Knox Hotel or something and much like the WFIA Fan Fest in 1978 at the beautiful Andrew Johnson Hotel this place was under renovation when Bobby and Doug walked into the fucking room they looked up and there was a huge bubble on the paint in the ceiling and a drip coming through it where if you'd stuck your finger in it you could have taken a shower so the accommodations apparently were lovely once they got them straightened out. But anyway, I digress. I called Doug Markham. I tell him, shit's gone south. I'm headed home. I don't know what you're going to do with the hotel. Find Tony. Then 
Before I can call Dennis, Dennis calls me because Tony's got Dennis's phone number. And Tony has called Dennis, begging him to beg me to come back, and he'll make it right. How the, Then when I tell Dennis what Tony didn't tell him, Dennis is like, well, fuck, now I don't know if I want to go. But I said, no, you've had medical bills. Go over there and get your fucking money from that fucking guy. Because we're talking thousands of dollars. I said, go get your money from that fucking guy. Because once again, I knew if Dennis Condry was standing in front of him, he wasn't going to fucking stiff anybody. So then I said, but you know, you tell Tony Hunter, no, the, he had his fucking chance. He's had his chance. I've been rushing and stressed and dealing with bullshit for fucking weeks now. And I ain't going to stand in that fucking parking lot and have him give me the runaround with his little mush fucking mouth. <laughs> then I call Stan. And the first thing when I told Stan, Stan, I'm on, I've been to Knoxville. I'm on the way home. He's like, I knew it. Cause he don't like Tony Hunter anyway. And he don't trust him. And so he knew it was too good to be true because the payoff was more than the midnight individually gets because it was a big show. And because I said, no, I'll take the fucking booth and you put the blah, 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 whatever. Stan, it was going to bring his wife, Maria. They've already reserved a rental car uh, to make a weekend out of it. They've already reserved a dog sitter. Uh, but as soon as I told Stan that what had happened, he said, fuck it. Because Stan Lane is the only human being that wants to leave his house less than I do even for money. So he said, fuck it. He started canceling shit. He said, I knew it. I said, Stan, you were right. Cause I had to talk Stan into it once he heard Tony Hunter. So then I get in another thunderstorm on the way home. Right. Oof. And <laughs> have to pull over and sit in a fucking cracker barrel parking lot. Wait till that deluge fucking. And finally I get back home. I in eight Hour, because it was a lot quicker going back than it was going down there, even with stopping and waiting. Because I didn't even turn the radio on until I got to Lexington. That's 180 miles. I was so fucking mad. I went 500 miles round trip to Knoxville and back to cuss Tony Hunter out. It took me eight fucking hours and 15 minutes. <clears throat> so when I got in the house, immediately I go to Twitter and I tweeted, Hey, everybody, I've been jerked around, lied to, bullshitted, and left standing in a parking lot in Knoxville. I will not be at Fanboy Expo. Blame Tony Hunter and a fucking guy named Dave. Well, then that's on Twitter. I've tried to let everybody know, right? It's not like I'm going to get on by commercial time on the local TV news. I'm not going to be there, but I didn't want everybody to be blindsided and go if they weren't already. Come to find out people were traveling from all over the place. And by the way, also Glenn Jacobs was supposed to be there <laughs> at the big wrestling event organized by Tony Hunter, apparently. And he wasn't there. So the fucking guy false advertised the mayor of Knox County in Knoxville. Amazing. But anyway, so I tweet. But then, you know, there's the Facebook. And you know, I don't know how to do the Facebook. Apparently, also, when I tweeted that, people started tweeting. Well, I'm not surprised because Fanboy Expo on their Twitter account, still had the dates for the 2018 show and had not tweeted at all since April. <laughs> but somebody said, well, they're primarily on Facebook. Well, I ain't, so I didn't know about these things, right? I'm the only one promoting this fucking thing on Twitter and uh, on the shows here. But apparently, somebody, whoever writes their Facebook page, if it indeed is you, Dave, Dave, I'm going to be looking for you, pal. Somebody wrote, Jim Cornette canceled for a dumb reason. He went to the wrong hotel, got mad, and left. Like, I would go to where I thought the rooms were if I had not been specifically instructed. I made a mistake, and then I decided, well, instead of trying to find out or checking with anybody or just doing anything about this, I'll just go home. So that's when I figured out how to put up my first Facebook post. Oh. It was from Har it was from Harley Quinn's account, <laughs> 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 but later, <laughs> later Stacy uh, switched it over and she put up some stuff. And also, a, a good cult member put up my comment on like every one of the comments or whatever. So it was covered. Where I said, "You crooked motherfuckers, fuck you all. You think I made a five hundred mile round trip to cuss out a fucking goof?" The Lost Pile Cousin, Gomer, Goober, and Tony. 
right? And who is fucking Dave? And fuck Dave, because Dave wasn't there, man. So then I determined that I was not only going to fuck with Tony Hunter, but I was going to fuck with these fanboy expo and whoever this fucking Dave asshole is too. And then one last thing came up. One last thing. I made sure to talk to Dennis because I wanted to make sure he got paid. And he did. I said, Dennis, I said, what in the world did Tony Hunter have to say for himself for causing all that chaos, for not knowing what the fuck was going on, for just driving me out of fucking town? You know what Dennis said, Brian? No. He said, Corny, he just doesn't know why you're mad at him. <laughs> and then he uttered the <laughs> fatal words. Tony told me you cost yourself thousands of dollars this week. Okay, Dennis, let me, I've got to talk to you later because I need to make a phone call. Now, I'm not a motherfucker who would call someone up and threaten their life on the phone. I'm not someone who would call up and make literally terroristic threats to a motherfucker on his voicemail. But if I was that kind of motherfucker, it would go something like this. You lying motherfucker. You piece of shit moron. You disgusting fucking prick. You got the nerve to tell Dennis Condry that I cost myself all these thousands of As far as I'm concerned, you motherfucker, you owe me 10,000 fucking dollars and you will until the day that one of us dies. And I better never see you in fucking person again is what I would have said. Had I been saying this on his voicemail, I better never see your fucking rat face in person again. Stay the fuck away from me for the rest of your life, or I will run you down in the parking lot, slit your fucking throat, pull your eyeballs out, and skull fuck you, you motherfucker. That's what I would have said. Metaphorically speaking. Metaphorically speaking. And that was... and. <laughs> To this day, Dave has never emailed me. Dave has never called me. I don't know who the fuck Dave is. Dave is supposedly the guy that runs the thing, is all I know, and apparently he's as big of an idiot as his fucking stooge, Tony Hunter. Even Half Pint, old Half Pint even had a critical blog about it, about yeah. Fanboy on the, uh, on, on the interweb there. I saw that. You know, it's interesting with this Tony guy, and you brought up, Doug Ward or Marvin Ward or Doug Gibb, whatever name he uses. You brought up yeah. him earlier. There's an interesting thing with wrestling. I don't know if they, if you see this everywhere else. I don't think you do. Where someone decides, hey, you know, I really want to do something with wrestling. And they get in over their head and they fuck a bunch of wrestlers or wrestling personalities. And you think that's it. They're gone. And then they still like, you know what? Let me try this again. Let yes. me do this shit again. And it happens again. And these guys just. I guess because so many people in wrestling will just do anything for money. They keep jumping in. It's, it's, it's like locusts or cicadas. Every, what is it? Every five, three to five years or five to seven years, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they come back and they get run off again. But, but here's the thing with the comic cons. I've, I've, I told this story, but it was so long ago. We've got so many new listeners, but that fandom fest here in Louisville through about three summers ago, I had been there and done it one time before, and not only did I sell a shitload of comic books, but also merchandise, and I dealt directly with the guy running it, and they had every member of the cast of Walking Dead when it was hot. William Shatner, Gene Simmons, everybody was there. They drew like 40,000 people. A couple years later, go to do it, same people running it. It's going to be at the International Convention Center. The guy books me for it, and then I realize I never hear from him again. And because it's here in town, we didn't need a hotel, right? About four days before the show, we read on Twitter that they have moved the event from the Kentucky International Convention Center to an abandoned Macy's at the Jefferson Mall. <laughs> and 20 of the 25 celebrities have pulled out. And that's how I tweeted, and they know something I don't know, and I'm joining them, right? And that made the local news. It was a shit show here, and everybody was mad. <laughs> and the last time I was supposed to do a comic convention in Knoxville, this guy had seen me at a, at a little show. This was five years ago, I bet. 
I'd done a little show down in London, Kentucky, just a one-day little sci-fi thing. It was cool. We went and bought some stuff. This guy says, hey, I'm running the Marble City Comic Con. And I lived in East Tennessee five years. I never knew that Knoxville was Marble City, so he was reaching on that one. It, apparently it is, but still. What is that? What does that mean? Because well, I, I, There was some marble construction. I don't know. The, the marble like counters, not marbles like you play. I don't fucking know. Anyway, he books me for this thing, and for that, I said, look, I'll advertise your show and plug it, but I need a little guarantee in a booth. And, oh, no problem. I never heard from that fucking guy again. So the week before the show, after I'd emailed and never got a response after I'd called and his voicemail full deal again, I announced on my podcast, I won't be there this weekend. And guess who called me? <laughs> the guy. No, a friend of his. Oh. And said, old Joe, I can't remember what this fucking idiot's name was. Old Joe is just, he's just covered up. He's just so, he's just swamped. He's just so busy. I, and And this was not like a huge fucking event, right? And I was potentially the most, well-known name in any field there and i said if he's too busy to fucking call me back and tell me that i'm still coming to this thing he's too busy to pay me and he's in too far over his head and he can do it without me so tell him he saved that payoff and lose my number but i'm going to tell you something now for the first time that you don't know about something that happened to me this year and I didn't want to say this because it was going to reflect badly on a friend of mine. You remember Gabe Yoakum? Yeah, yeah, I remember the name. Gabe Yoakum at C2E2 in Chicago this past March, and he was the, the guy that got me involved in the uh, Keystone Comic Con in Philly last September with that long, giant airplane ramp and the shitty guard and the union and everything. That's right, yeah. <clears throat> but Gabe Yoakum worked for, I say this because he has turned in his resignation and left these people for these reasons, and is now uh, happier and employed elsewhere. This Reed Exhibitions, Reed Pop, that was running these shows, they're a big company. They do these big shows. C2E2 is a massive show. It was, it, 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 the most I've ever grossed on a Comic Con and the big VIP thing, this is a big show, right? Big company. You'd think they'd have their shit together. Guess when I got the final b remaining balance of my VIP show money from the C2E2 show in March. You're right. We haven't talked about this. So it was in March. We're in July. I'm going to guess July. You are correct. Two, well, two weeks ago. It may be been June 30th. It might have been maybe the 29th. Since I've, I dealt with them for two shows, if Gabe Yoakum had not been there, it wouldn't even have been two shows. It wouldn't have been one complete show. I would have left without Gabe Yoakum, who fixed every fuck up who took care of every fan that bought a ticket, who took care of me, who personally was going around doing everything. The guy I thought he was going to have a nervous fucking breakdown, and he's like 6'6 six, six and 330. He's fucking mammoth. And he was carrying shit on his own, and he was doing sh I mean, he did everything. He, he arranged the food for the VIPs. He did all this stuff, right? Dealing with their office, just on two comic conventions, there was a check lost in quotation marks that had to be reissued there were every check was late and it was late per the terms of their own contracts because we would make a deal they would execute a contract i would sign it and then they would violate it every check was late one check was lost uh, my vip was light you know why because they wrote a contract saying that they were going to supply me with hotel and the, the deal on the vip and when they sent me my vip money they took the hotel out and violated their own contract. <laughs> and he had to, around dealing with his father passing away in Chicago and a bunch of other personal stuff he had going on, he had to stand over them for weeks until they would recognize their own mistake and send me my money. <clears throat> so, and that, that, and they, so they've lost the only employee that they had that could fucking do anything. So that's the reason I'll never be back at C2E2 again. Wonderful show. Svengoolie's there, great fucking show, great fucking, massive thing. Can't trust them, can't deal with them. In general, because I mean, you do, I mean, not as much, and especially the rest of the year, you do appearances, you do a lot of appearances some years. What percentage of guys you deal with who are acting as agents or acting as the actual convention promoters, what percentage of them actually pay on time? 
Well, it, no, it, to be honest, I've never had a, once again, I mentioned my friend Jared Greer runs Lexcon, ran the Derby City Comic Con here in Louisville. Uh, you know, always has his shit together. Um, it, it normally, it, the, and I don't do that many Comic Cons because I don't travel the country for them that far, but I've done Louisville, I've done Lexington, I've done Knoxville and Memphis and a few other things. But it, it's it, 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 now the wrestling promoters are outshining the comic convention promoters. Uh, MLW, they have been the w wonderful travel lady, Brandy. You know, I make my own travel arrangements as far as transportation because I always drive everywhere. But I have to have a hotel confirmation or I will not leave my house. Most of the time I do my own hotels now because of these problems. But when it's something like this where it's supposed to be included and it's right near the convention center or it's it's something it's a show that's actually in a hotel. OK, fine. But with MLW, all the hotel reservations and the information has been there has been they put us up in some nice joints and they do their production there also. Um, the, the cars they had for me, the NWA, Dave Lagana, Billy Corgan, those guys treated us like gold, especially in Charlotte's nicest hotel I've ever been in, in Charlotte, <clears throat> all the information, you know, up front with everything, the scheduling wrestlecade on Thanksgiving weekend in Winston Salem. And I want to plug that the midnight express will be there. Bobby Stan and Dennis I've talked to Tim Blaze. He's the right-hand man of Tracy Myers, and they have done a great job there. I've done it in the past. I've enjoyed it. I'm not, I didn't do it last year. I'm not doing it this year because I've just got past the point in my life where I want to travel on Thanksgiving weekend. And that's the legitimate reason. And Tim understood that and, you know, issued the invitation about changed my mind. But they have a first-class operation there. The hotel's beautiful. All the arrangements worked out. They always have a crowd. It, it, you know, it, it, the wrestling promoters suddenly are getting their shit together and these comic book fucks are falling in a hole. Gary Damron over at All-Star Wrestling, he goes above and beyond to take care, especially the legends. And once again, with him, I do all my hotel and car. It's only four hours down the road, but he brings in the Midnight or the Rock and Roll or Austin Idol, whoever he's brought in, they're all taken care of. There's never a problem. Nobody's ever standing around. And it... it, it I I am just I am baffled. As a matter of fact, going to WrestleCade on Thanksgiving weekend in it was 2014. It was the first year I did it. Because they were going to do a roast of me at the club next to the hotel on Friday, and then the fan fest on Saturday and the big super show on Saturday night at that big convention center. They draw two thousand people. <clears throat> so I decide instead of driving nine hours first thing Friday morning and getting there and doing the show, I'm gonna go halfway just to Knoxville on Thanksgiving night, check in, get a good night's sleep and be right over to Winston Salem the next day, you know, fresh and get there early. And thank goodness I did because that I get to Knoxville, get off the interstate on Thanksgiving night. Now about eight o'clock, I get off the interstate to get some gas and my fuel pump goes out. And immediately the car dies. There's no power steering. You can't you can't do nothing. Now, just the 20 minutes previously, I was doing 70 miles an hour down fucking the mountain, right, toward Knoxville. So it was a good time in a parking lot. But now I'm stranded in a parking lot. And I'm within sight of my hotel. So to make sure I made that show, I got AAA Premier. They will tow me 200 miles anywhere I want to go for nothing, right? I've got every road coverage in the world. I get a tow truck on Thanksgiving night to tow me to the hotel that I've got reservations for. I get that same tow truck to come back the next morning and tow me to Lance Cunningham Ford in Knoxville, where I leave my truck to get serviced, rent a car, transfer all my shit into that fucking car, and I was still in Winston-Salem and on time for the show that night. On the way back... I drove the rental car back, stayed an extra night in Knoxville, went back, picked up on Monday morning my truck, dropped the rental car off, and finally got home. But I made that fucking show because I promised I would, and they were up front with me, and all their shit checked out. And that's what I told Tony fucking Hunter. I said, you motherfucker, once again, I, may, I, t I told him a week and a half beforehand, we just had a death in a family, a lot of shit going on, but I'm going to be there, Tony, because I promised I've advertised it. People are expecting it and I ain't going to let you down. 
Guess which side led who down? So, anyway, there are some good Outlaw Mud Show promoter stories, but there is one person who's not an Outlaw Mud Show promoter, and that is Marty and the fine folks at T-Mart Promotions behind the gathering in Charlotte in August. <laughs> How's that for a segue? <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> because I've already, as a matter of fact, you hear this? I hear this that. Is all the information, my schedule, <laughs> the Midnight Express's schedule, all we know where the hotel is. It's the Hilton University place right there where it always is. And it's all here in my hand, and I will be there along with, list these names, and these, these are not even all of them, but Kurt Angle, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, Barry Windham, me and the Midnight Express, including Ravishing Randy Rose, Bob Backlund, Sergeant Slaughter, Ron Simmons, Lex Luger, Larry Zabisco, Magnum TA, Bill Dundee's going to be there. Ken Patera, Nord the, Nord the Barbarian, probably ain't going to be there from what I'm reading on the fucking internet today. Why did something um, happen? Check out Nord the Barbarian on the internet. Um, <laughs> okay. Kevin Sullivan, Mark Lorenz is going to be there. John Tatum and Missy Hyatt are going to be together again by popular demand. Where's Tessa? Um, you know, I don't know. But anyway, I mean, Duggan's going to be there. Uh, it, it's it's going to be great. Baron Von Raschke, superstar. So anyway, it's August 15th through the 18th. I will be appearing at the barbecue on the night of the 15th, and we'll be there all day the 16th and 17th for the dealer's room, uh, Midnight Express photo ops, autographs, the banquet on Friday night, be there on Saturday in the dealer's room. Sunday, uh, uh, I'm I'm headed out because we got to get back home. But um, anyway, Charlotte, the gathering, T-Mart, T-MartPromotions.com, not an outlaw mud show. Okay, you got me searching on the internet. I don't see anything about John Nord. What, did, what am I missing? Where did I just, hold on, God damn it. You may have to edit some of this, but I'll find it now. <laughs> You, I'll find this just because I know what I read. I don't have a brain tumor and I'm not goddamn Tony Hunter where I'm just a complete imbecile. Okay. Right here on PW insider. Okay. July 16th, one thirty-four PM. The Minnesota, Minnesota, Minnesota star <laughs> tribune has just reported that former WWF and AWA star, John Nord, AKA the berserker was sentenced yesterday to five years probation to be placed in restrictive housing and banned from any driving whatsoever. Whoa. Following a series of arrests for driving under the influence, seven in total in recent years. And there was some other things. I believe it's there's 16 incidents in the last decade where he's been charged with either a felony or a misdemeanor. So I'm, I'm thinking he might not be at the gathering, but yeah. don't cancel just because of that, folks. Berserk. It's still going to be fun. He's gone berserk. Well, you motherfucker. <laughs> um, and we, we've got, before we talk about what you're doing this week, anyway, so that, yes, folks, so that is my appearance in Charlotte between now and spring 2020. If there is an MLW or NWA event within 500 miles of Louisville, Kentucky, that they would like my services at, I'm pretty sure we can work that out. Uh, but otherwise, I'm concentrating on our family affairs. It's going to necessitate some trips out of town. And you and I have our project, that our secret project, that we're supposed to have been doing for years. And I've got a bunch of other stuff that I can do at home and not have to deal with having a nervous breakdown every time I leave the house dealing with these fucking people. And big and small, apparently, companies, it makes no difference. Anyway, uh, you, uh, I was telling you this a couple weeks ago, and you said, well, wouldn't you know who won the pony? I was saying, you know, every time I go into a fucking locker room these days, or even just go out on the street, or even just go into a Wendy's, every motherfucker has headsets on, has something stuck in their ear, has headphones, has earplugs, has wires hanging off of them, is listening to something. It, and it, it's just, it's everywhere now, everybody. And I said, why the fuck is this? And you said, because it's the thing to do and it's fashionable and this is what everybody does now. And also that's how they listen to our fine programming. So I guess I can't find any fault with it. But you said, wouldn't you know who won the pony? If you want headphones or earbuds or headsets or whatever the kids call them these days, JC, 
we're about to be fixed up because we've got a new friend of the family, Raycon. That's right, Raycon. Now, first of all, these are not even, I say headphones because that's the terminology I know. Apparently, some of my terminology besides being homophobic is out of date, but these are earbuds. They're not headphones. They're earbuds and they're wireless. Yeah, that's the big deal. They're wireless because so many of the earphones you see, people still have cords attached like the Apple headphones that people wear. These are completely wireless. Well, that's what, because you know, I told you that story and God love him, but Kerry Von Erich one night in Dallas at the Sportatorium, he's wearing the Walkman headset with the wires to the Walkman thing and he's lacing up his boots and son of a bitch, without knowing it, he laced the fucking Walkman wire up in his boots and somebody yelled, hey, Carrie, and he stood up and almost snapmared his own self over flat. <laughs> but those things can be dangerous. And I see people riding bicycles and even riding motorcycles with these wires hanging off of them. These things are wireless. And they're not the giant, because I remember, but you know, when, you know, when I got stereo equipment back in the 70s, back when Edison invented it, you know, the headphones were huge and they weighed about six pounds a piece, whatever. These are very light and they're very comfortable. And, but anyway, you told me about these things and I said, well, now, you know, and, and everybody out there knows that I always like to endorse personally, whatever we advertise. And in this case, I'm not going to be able to, because I'm not going to figure out how to work them because I don't have the smartphone and I don't know how this Bluetooth shit and this, and all these things. I'm seeing people talking to fucking NASA with shit stuck in their ears, right? And I don't know how that works, and everybody knows it. So it would be bullshit coming from me. But I did market research. Not only did I, with the discount that we have for having so many listeners, and we're going to talk to you about that in a second, folks. Not only did I get you a set, but I got Stacy a set because she knows how to work all that stuff. And it's not even that hard. No, and she very easy. She, she actually, and they've got different interchangeable fucking buds, I guess, for, for the size of your ear, whether you got a little teeny tiny ear, or a big mega mega ear, or just a uh, just right ear, it, you know, you can customize it. And she had stuff playing through the, the, the earbuds in no time, even though there was no wires attached to them. It was, it was witchery and trickery is what it was. And she said, you can listen to anything you want. I, I guess you can't listen into other people's phone calls if you'd want to. I don't think it does that, but you can listen to anything you want. It, it, apparently, normal people know how to work these things. Is that correct? It's very easy? Very easy. I was actually surprised just how easy it was right out of the box. That's one of the things you look for. I think like we've been spoiled. Well, I say we, not you. But us that are up with what's happening in society have been yes. spoiled by like Apple because you open an Apple package and things are ready to go. And then you get a lot of other things that you open it and you still have to do work. These literally right out of the package, ready to go. And I, uh, you know, I'm actually taking this out right now. As you say that, one of the cool things you mentioned this before was it came with uh, the earbuds came with like a, I don't know what you would call it. The thing that actually fits in your ear. A sizing thing where it's different sizes so you can customize it to your own head. Yeah, and this one, it came yeah. with five additional discover your perfect fit, it says. And it gives yeah. you a chance to find one that actually fits your ear. And this actually helped me. This was great. I found one that fit good. I got some good songs on my phone, unlike you and your mixtapes. And I've been able to listen to some music. I've been using these for the last several days. I used them when I was laying outside the other day. Used them the other day when, when, you were, when you were laying outside. Yeah, I was working on my tan. Oh, good God. In you New, don't work in New on Jersey? I'm surprised you don't glow fluorescent green. Well, at night, maybe. But All right. the point is I've been using these. I've been using Well, that's, what, that's what Stace did, too. She actually even put them on my head so that I could hear what it sounded like. And because another thing, I, she's wanted these or wanted things like these. Didn't know about the Raycon deal. And she showed me how much they cost. I said, no, fuck you. To, you know, <laughs> listen, well, you know, you get a goddamn headset, 20 bucks or whatever. But these things, instead of the hundreds of dollars a pair for the wireless, super duper, high fidelity, all kinds of bullshit. These things are half of, of the other earbud things. And, and all the celebrities are wearing them now. So anyway, uh, it, uh, for everybody but me. I'm not going to bullshit you. I'm not going to be doing this. I'm going to be sitting on the couch reading a book and listening to my Edison, you know, Victorola that you have. To <laughs> find. Actually, I have an Edison Ambarola from 1916. It's got the cylindrical wax 
oh, uh, tube records and you got to wind it up. But anyway, nevertheless. Wow. But if you want to be like Brian Last or Stacy or anybody else in the world, and you're already wearing these clunky things with all these wires and everything on you, don't break your neck. Don't get into an accident. Get the light stuff, the high quality sound, no wires, nothing to tie you down. Go to Raycon. That's R A Y C O N, Raycon.com. I'm sorry, buy Raycon, B U Y R A Y C O N, buy Raycon.com slash J C E, and you get 15% off your order. Especially if you've been thinking about getting something like this, now's the time. And these are the the buds. So buy Raycon.com slash JCE, 15% off of these uh, fine buds. And it's always good to get 15% off of a fine bud. It's a good deal, too, because like you said earlier, they're already about half the price of all the other premium wireless earbuds on the market. And yeah, any other better deal, they'd have to pay you to take them. Yeah, and then you get an additional 15% off for being a member of the Cult of Cornet. Pretty good. Not bad. Not too shabby. Buy Raycon.com slash JCE and listen to your playlist and not Jim's playlist using Raycon earbuds. You know, what's the matter with my playlist? If my playlist wasn't on a cassette tape, if it was, if some people have put my playlists out on the, on the internet, they liked them so much. But you see, actually, there's an example. Someone who, I know a few people, I know John Boucher did this, who made a playlist and put it on Spotify. You could listen to that using these earbuds, using the Raycon earbuds. You could listen to that. Well, see there, so you can have the best of both time periods. And let me actually just give a, a full endorsement here, because the one I got, the E50 eardrums, these have been really, really great. So I want to actually say the specific one I got, Raycon's E50 eardrums. These one. Well, now that that's the one that I've got, that I got Stacy too. So they, they actually have other models also. Yeah, they have other models, other colors. It comes in various uh, colors. Well, holy fuck. What well, color, better. What color did you get her? We got black. I got black and gold. Ooh. Shows you what they think of me. Well, anyway. So <laughs> but they got all kinds of different models, different colors. That's right. And and your hotel reservation confirmation will come through also. So anyway. <laughs> before we talk about all elite wrestling and and I found out I've I found out right before the show went on the air, I apparently missed something. So we'll talk about that in a second. But what are you doing this week? We have another packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Let me mention a few things here. Kentucky Fried Wrestling returns this week. Scott Bowden welcomes J.J. Dillon to the show. This is a really fun conversation. Hear J.J.'s memories of his brief time in Memphis and so much more. You can hear that at KFRPod.com. Or, of course, it's available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts, including Spotify. Also want to make mention of the Super Studcast for patrons of the Studcast, Patreon.com. Slash studcast for only two ninety nine you get in the door and the latest episode is up right now ninety minutes part one Ron Fuller speaking with Dirty Dutch Mantel this is oh a, that's got to be classic you would love this conversation I didn't want to jump in I just wanted to listen to these two guys go I didn't realize you know where Dutch got his name I mean it was an original Dutch Mantel but do you know who gave him the name Dutch Mantel it was uh I don't I sound like Lance now. Like Lance. <laughs> I've heard the story, but now I can't call the name. Buddy Fuller. That's that's right, that's right, because Buddy Fuller had known of the original Dutch Mantel when he was out at his but yes, it Dutch he had told Roy. me that a while back. Yes. Because the original Dutch Mantel trained Roy Welch, the That's right. The patriarch of the uh, Welch family in the wrestling business. But here, so much great stuff on there. We talked Because about before that, D Dutch had been <laughs> He'd been Wayne Cowan briefly. He'd been Chris Gallagher. Yeah. He'd been, as a matter of fact, for a brief period of time, he was Dutch Bass when he was teamed up with Ron Bass and managed by Ma Bass, I believe. But but Dutch Mantel's the one that stuck, that stood, that took or stuck. It stuck. Or stuck. We we talk all about this sticky stuff. Plus Japan <laughs> wrestling riots, and Dutch goes into detail about the murder of Bruiser Brody, which of course happened in July of 1988. Ron had never spoken to Dutch about that, and Ron really liked Bruiser Brody. So this is a really interesting conversation. Like I said, part one, 90 minutes, patreon.com slash studcast. You can get information about all Arcadian Vanguard shows by going to Twitter, of course, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard, and of course, the mothership of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast <laughs> Network, the 605 Super Podcast. I'll do it again. The mothership! 
Thank you so much for Mr. Cornette blowing out my ears. I wish I was wearing those Raycon earbuds right now. But uh, thank you to everyone who's been checking out the show. We've just had a record month somehow of people going through the archives. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. And of course, the reaction to the latest Star Wars. I thought it was a disaster. Turns out everyone loved it. I need to calm the fuck down. Episode 100, still in production. More has been added to the show. I'm going to reveal one more segment for the show. We, of course, talked about the In the News with Jim Cornette, the top 10, and so much more. Also, the latest installment in my series of conversations with Fumi Saito, looking at the history of Japanese wrestling. This time, we're going to cover roughly the period of 1981 to 1984. So much happening. Roughly. Just a, just an estimate. Well, we go a little bit above it, a little bit below it. You never know what will happen, but we talk about everything. Think about this period of time, Jim. All the talent raids going back and forth between New Japan and All Japan. All the problems New Japan has internally with the embezzlement scandal and everything else. This is an incredible that, that was uh, Was that about the period of time that uh, Brody and Snuka got on a train going one place for New Japan and turned around and got off and got on the other train going for All Japan? Or what? No, that was actually a few years later. But again, remember, Brody jumped to New Japan in 85, right. which was a big deal. I mean, that was a big, big deal. He not only jumped to New Japan, he then refused to lose. But anyway, we'll talk more about that, hear more information, and catch up on the Super Podcast today at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your very favorite podcast, The Mothership. And once again, thank you to everyone who's been supporting the Arcadian Vanguard family of shows. We've had a few record months in a row, and things keep growing, and we really do appreciate it. Thank you. I know, I know one guy you could get on as a guest on one of your shows that would put the numbers over the top. Who's that? Dave. Yeah, I can't find him. How am I get Dave, get nobody can find him. See, that's the thing. He never does interviews. Nobody can find him. If you if you landed the exclusive anyway, folks. Was that the Cheech and Chong bit? Was it Dave? Dave's not here, man. Yeah. yeah. It's the same thing. They, that's Dave, what they pulled on the you. Stuff. Dave's not here, man. I think maybe that was what Tony Hunter's problem was. <laughs> it's a big Cheech and Chong fan. He was pulling the routine on you. <laughs> all right, all right. We, we got to talk about... Um, we got to talk about it because we both watched it. Well, we wa- I just found out before we went on the air, I watched the show, the All Elite Wrestling Fighter Fest, or not that. No, that was last one. This is Fight for the Fallen. That what? last one was Fighter. They're fighting a lot. Um, but I didn't watch it live because I learned my lesson last time. I went and, and I've been rushing today. I had to, had to get the packages out at the post office and see Susie. Uh, I'm going to see her one more time this week, and then she's gone. But I got back, and I sat down, and I clicked on the thing, and I said, this fucking show is three and a half hours long. And I'm like, fuck. And now from what you tell me, there was a pre-show that was on top of that. Yes. That I didn't even know it, it happened. Well, the big thing you missed in the pre-show, apparently, I didn't see the whole pre-show because it wasn't part of the stream. I guess you had to do it separately, and I didn't watch the show live because I was out that night. And there was a Sunny Kiss match versus the Librarian, but apparently the big thing you missed was there was a tag team match, and I didn't see it, but I believe it was Dr. Britt Baker and one of the Japanese women wrestlers against someone else and another Japanese women wrestler, and apparently she either got concussed or got her bell rung because in the middle of the match, and I've never really seen this before, she went for a hot tag to the wrong corner. <laughs> and I'm sorry to laugh if she and did, really did got she, hurt. Did she went and realized or she tagged the, the girl? It was like the one where she like runs and jumps and like tags and she's like, oh, and then oh. she like get up and go to the other. I really felt bad, but it was fun. Oh, I, you know, I feel bad too because she, she's good. We've enjoyed her, what we've seen, you know, of her. But, and I, I assume, know, yeah, quite frankly. But, but here's the thing. Those girls, they they all dress in the flousy costumes and everything, but they're all like middle school girl size. And can you really tell them apart? I, you know, if, if especially if you just got your bell rung and if you're out of the corner of your eye, oh, she should know where her her corner was. But I, so we missed the librarians. I'm not even going to mention Sonny Kiss because I didn't see it and I don't know what he did. I'm glad I missed the librarians because that's fucking grisly death. Just has the stench of fucking outlaw all over it. Um, we hope Britt Baker feels better, but uh, we're burying the lead here. The point is, they had a pre show plus that show. They expected people to sit there and watch their computers for four and a half hours. 
Well, again, and I know you're a little different, but a lot of people would get a feed on their computer and be able to send it to their TV, whether it's a smart TV or whether they have Apple TV hooked up or All right, they, they, they want people to watch the same show on their TV for four and a half hours. For fuck's sake, Gone with the Wind was what, three hours and a little change? That was my biggest complaint, and it's an industry-wide complaint, but it affects AEW here, and that is everything that just takes way too long. Every show is too long. No show should be going above three hours, and every show, it seems, goes more than three hours now. I, well, I mean, you know, I, I just did an MLW TV taping that went right at four hours, but that was for four hours of television. Yeah, the live event, went, you know, but uh, the best live events I ever saw in the Omni, in the Mid-South Coliseum, Greensboro, whatever, two hours and a half. Maybe closing in on three if it was the biggest card ever signed. But anyway, so we missed the pre-show, folks. Shoot us. Actually, that the reason I saw the pre-show last time upon reflection is because I watched it live and got so upset over the fucking uh, Battle Royal that I turned it off, right? And then That's was right. there a pre-show on the last thing? I can't. Yes, fuck that, was, that was the one with the librarian match against. Oh, uh, but we saw that. They put that on the feed that time because I didn't watch that live. Oh, okay. So if, if maybe they're get they're, they're see they're taking our criticisms, I, even though they're still doing a, a pre show, they're not letting anybody see it. So that's a that's a positive. This is a good impress so far, and I'm going to have some compliments for some people here, folks. I should have said that at the top of the program, but <laughs> but, but now I, but actually no. If I had people to go, oh fuck, he's going to say some good things about him. We won't listen anyway. Uh, the cold open of the television program, great. Great production, great editing. The graphics, the packages, the opens, the voiceovers are the best and most professional thing on this show because they're spending money. They've got talented people editing and producing, and the, the voiceover guy sounds like, you know, fucking James Earl Jones. So that, once again, they've got a wonderful location for their store, and it's attractive as all hell. If it's got curb appeal. Now they just got to put stock the shelves. The opening match, six man tag MJF, Sean Spears, and Sammy Guevara against Jimmy Havoc, Darby Allen, and Jelly Janella. Jelly Janella? <laughs> Jelly Janella. Yeah, because he looks. You know when you're eating biscuits and jelly and you drop some of the jelly invariably slides over the edge of the fucking bicket and drops onto your fucking plate and that he looks like the blob of jelly that does a jelly janella. His entrance, somebody pointed this out on Twitter. Jelly Janella's entrance looks like he's literally squatting down and taking a shit on the entrance ramp and, and uh, on the company and the business in general. He looks like he's taking a shit. Uh, JR's voice opened us up and that was refreshing. And then I hear they didn't have an uh, announcer on camera. I don't think for, I skipped some of these entrances because good God, they do take forever. Um, Excalibur still got his mask on. Alex Marvez is back and Alex don't take this wrong, but good God, you, he still sounded, he was better than the first time. Of course, Patty Hearst, the second fucking hostage statement she made from the SLA was better than the first one. It had a little more oomph to it. Uh, please don't do this anymore, Alex. You sound scared to death. And he quivers in his voice. Like, but it's always, like, I, it's always like he's calling golf or something because it always sounds like he's just like he's just he's so low compared to everyone else that it's what's going on there. Well, plus, he's got no confidence because he knows he's not any good. And and I don't know why, he's, you know, they're making him do this. It's like forceful, forced labor. But anyway, um, yeah. So anyway, here we have this six man. I've just got random notes. Jimmy Havoc looks like a homeless man that just wandered into the ballpark, trying to find a place to sit and a leftover hot dog. Uh, MJF starts off the match. He's selling for Havoc, Jelly Janella, and a 140-pound zombie. All Havoc did at the first was bite MJF's hand. I guess he can do that all right. Go, 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 Guevara, or Guevara, is a good-looking, athletic, underneath babyface. There's nothing the matter with him. Sean Spears, now I see him without so much clutter around him. He looks great. He had to back down from the 140-pound man, which was ridiculous. His work looks great. As, as I've said, I'm conflicted on Darby Allen because it's a, it's a great, creepy gimmick. 
Except we found out it's not a gimmick. He really is a fucking lunatic. He likes to hurt himself and spray him in the face with pepper spray. So I, I, I'm conflicted trying to put him over because he's a fucking idiot. Really is one of these stupid skateboard fucks. I have to say, I, I think, I don't know if I want to say he's winning me over. Uh, Cause I was not as negative as you obviously, but I think he has something. It's like a, a Jeff Hardy kind of appeal. Yeah. And, yeah there and you go. There you go. I think, I mean, at all those guys on that team, him, Jimmy Havoc and Joey Janela, I thought he was the one that not only stood out, but the one who got the biggest reaction from the fans too. Well, yeah. And I mean, he can, he can do things athletically. Um, you know, Havoc's a freak show and Jelly just fucking, they like him, I guess, cause he's a fucking slob. I don't know any other reason why I like, but anyway, it, Darby Allen, the flying stuff. Great. You know, Janela, sloppy, reckless, pudgy. MJF was the only real heel here and also the only real worker in the match. And I'm not talking about doing moves. I'm talking about being a worker. A worker has nothing to do with any moves you do or don't do. He was the only real worker. His, his and Spears' interplay was the only reason to have this match. And then, j did you see, they tweeted this. And I saw it and I retweeted it. Janela, the first spot that MJF and Spears got into when they started getting sideways with each other, Janela was in the middle of it. And some kind of way, he, he got in the way somehow where he had, MJF ducked a clothesline and I guess... Uh, Janela gave Spears the clothesline and then just stood there and then just after about five or six seconds just fell over like he didn't know where the fuck he was I guess he didn't know where the fuck he was but anyway that clothesline looked like shit too like after MJF ducked it well you know, dog, bar got... dog barks and a cat meows what's any of Janela's stuff gonna look like but hey, I, basically then all the partners started having issues they were they, they stopped tagging in and out and started doing shit to each other and diving around everywhere. And uh, what the fuck? You couldn't follow that. Then four of the guys laid out, obviously, so that two guys could do some shit. And then here comes everybody's favorite spot. <clears throat> it's everybody's favorite because it had me in it. Uh, Janela does his fucking goofy Death Valley driver on the ring apron to poor Guevara. And here's one thing. I, I've never... I've never seen anybody actually, I've never been in one of the meetings because they only started doing this move recently over the last few years because it was it's so stupid that nobody would have ever done it before when guys knew what they were doing. But I've never been in one of the guys where the guys sit down and talk about what they're going to do and somebody actually says, I'm going to pick you up on the apron and give you a Death Valley driver <clears throat> on the apron on the hardest part of the ring possibly drop you on your head and paralyze you you'll probably fall off onto the concrete floor you might hit the edge of the apron and to top it all off as i stand here right here right now i'm a fat pudgy fucking little short five foot eight fuck that doesn't weigh 200 pounds and has no muscle tone but even though you're small sammy i'm gonna pick you up and i'm gonna protect you what happened to guys saying no no that doesn't work for me brother no we're not going to be doing that. I'm not going to do anything that dangerous and irresponsible and reckless to you. And I'm not going to take anything from you doing it to me either. It's just not going to. So let's figure out what we're going to do. They just all just do this shit. No, no matter what the fucking guy looks like, that's going to give it to him. Nobody says no. <laughs> that's one of the biggest changes in the wrestling business. Fucking hell. Nobody says no. <clears throat> I can't imagine the look that you would have got out of anybody's face in the locker room from main event to first match, if somebody had said that in, in decent times. But anyway, he gives the guy, and of course it's sloppy, and he almost dropped him, and he could have hurt him. And then they both fall onto the floor, and, and Jelly's selling, but then suddenly he sees the floor camera in front of him, so he flips the camera off and says, fuck you, Jim Cornette, and then goes back to selling. <laughs> so I, I want to say, first of all, I encourage all of the all elite wrestlers to talk about me on their air that that billionaire is paying for as much as possible. <laughs> I encourage that. Secondly, I appreciate it. Janelle, Janella jelly, if we can be so formal, uh, because it just shows me that I have made you realize that I genuinely believe what I'm saying about you and your ilk and you're mad because I wanted you to be because you offend me every time you step in a wrestling ring and I see what our profession has the lows it stooped to. Um, so I definitely, like I said, I encourage, I think all the, the members of the roster should go out on that television time that a billionaire is paying for and talk about me.
and I'm actually the hottest heel in the company. Problem is, I don't work there and don't intend to in the near future. Um, and especially, and especially not with Je Jelly Janella. But then here was the stupidest thing, and then I'll let you go, Brian. He just did a Death Valley driver to poor old Sammy on the apron of the ring, and they fall off on a concrete floor and look like kill poor Sammy. Guess what the finish of the match was? You you did you noticed when you watched it, didn't you? Uh, you know, I actually don't remember off the top of my head what the finish was. Sean Spears did a Death Valley driver to G.G. Allen or Darby Allen or whatever his fucking name is in the ring and beat him with it. So not only did unprofessional pudgy fuck Jelly Janella bury the real star and the winner of the match by you doing his finish that he was going to do in that match before that and in a more dangerous and more impactful way. After, and then flipped off a person who doesn't even work for their company. But then Sean Spears was left with Pete in hand doing a fucking Death Valley driver in the nice safe ring after they'd already killed that move and beating the other guy, the one guy on the, the other team that might have something to him, Darby Allen. So that made a lot of fucking sense. Oh boy. You know, one of the things that bothered me, I'll t say it here, even though it was a show wide thing. And at this point it's becoming an industry wide thing. But during this match, I saw a lot of it because, there was that dissension amongst the teammates. The blind tag. Everyone in AEW does the blind tag. Oh, fuck. Where you just touch any part of the other guy's body and you're in the match. Well, and, and once again, I don't, I don't even begrudge them this. Of course, it's stupid. But nobody teaches that anymore. I, in, in OVW, we had class after class. Every time new guys would come in that had watched TV, you'd have to retrain them. In Ring of Honor, I'd tell them over and over again. Wherever I've been, I have to tell them over and over again, a legal tag, which is part of the art of tag team wrestling, that the revival performs so well. A legal tag is a guy with both feet on the apron of the ring with his hand on either the tag rope or the top turnbuckle, and he tags his partner hand to hand. There's no slap on the back. There's no tagging the guy's boot. No fucking nothing. Hand to hand under those parameters. That's a legal tag. Referees allow everything these days. Guys are sloppy. That's part of what makes it an art to be able to do that well and to do the blind tags and the double team tags and et cetera, et cetera, the right way, which none of these guys, because most of them have never been fucking trained. And then there's MJF, who's a star. He is a star. He is. I will say that more than anyone else in AEW, I look forward to seeing what he does. He's always, you can't take your eyes off him. Whether yeah. he's flipping off the fans or whether he's fighting with the other guys in the ring, he's so clever, he's so quick. He he may be my favorite guy in the business right now. And he's real, and they know it, and they can't stand it. And he do, he doesn't destroy his body with all his stupid shit because he actually has personality and talent, and he can work. Anyway, next match, Brandy versus Allie. This was a good time for me to make up some time. I'm not knocking either one of these girls, but if I didn't like this show, a girls match wasn't going to change my mind. Did you at least see the video before the match? I did not. It was actually really good. It was well, did, it, one of the video packages. It, I'm sure it was. They did an interview with Brandy where she was breaking down about her struggles and being an active wrestler due to injury. It was really, really good. I thought that was really well done. Then did the match follow it up? Follow it up. Uh, you know, they tried. <laughs> it wasn't for me. I'll just, it wasn't. Okay. It wasn't for me, but they tried. Moving on. I thought we weren't going to get a three-way, but here we got a three-way. I didn't see that match until after we had gone over the card on last week's show. After we went over the card on last week's show, like two or three matches were added after that point. Well, I watched every bit of this match, and I actually found something else good to say, and then they fucking shit on that for me by the end. Uh, but I will say these good things anyway. So it was the Dark Order, Evil Uno and Stu Grayson. So Evil Uno is the fat, sloppy guy with a mask, and Stu Grayson is the fairly good shape guy with no mask. They used to be the Super Smash Brothers, which apparently was a ripoff of a video game. And years ago, they, they were doing jobs on Ring of Honor TV, and they were fucking rotten, and they looked like two fucking, you know, turds in a punch bowl. and. Everybody was saying they were the greatest tag team in wrestling, and it was all that sloppy indie shit. Well, the fat guy's gotten fatter and sloppier and indier, if that's possible. <laughs> and Stu Grayson has something if he wasn't in one of the two worst tag team gimmicks that I've ever seen in my life, with Super Smash Brothers being the other one. 
And a close third would be the Dynamic Dudes. Ding dongs. Um, that wasn't even a tag team gimmick. That was a Jim Hurt acid trip. <laughs> um, so they, with their minions, the five masked guys that look goofy and then they come out with them and then they disappear. They faced Angelico and Jack Evans. Angelico, remember, is a, a, a white American guy with a Hispanic name that doesn't wear a mask. And Jack Evans is a guy that does all the flips, and they're both painfully thin, and they wear fluorescent green outfits. And their third opponents, and one of my new favorite tag teams, if they do this right, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy. I completely agree with you. I wrote that in my notes. I didn't know how you're going to react. I wrote, forget about the Marco stunt stuff, and I'm sure you'll have plenty to say, plenty well, to say yes, about that. Well, yes, yes, yes. But Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy could be a really, really great act. They big, got something yes. big with them. Yeah, I agree. Yes, and they have they have hit on, it's it's the Al Snow and Unabomb, but his baby faces, the big guy with the little guy with the, the, the mouth. This is more like Rocca and Perez, the big guy that does the cleanup and the little guy that sells. And... <laughs> It, it, the Marco stunt thing, they keep encouraging this small fucking child because he can jump around and do shit. Well, if you only weigh 100 pounds and you're only five feet tall, of course, and people can catch you. But the credibility is nil. It's fucking stupid. It looks outlaw. This kid has already hurt himself bad and is going to hurt himself real bad again doing all this goofy stuff. And there's reasons why four foot six white guys don't play in the NBA. So fuck, I'm sorry. And you're, and they're burying stars because yeah, that's what I was going to say. The dark order. It's, it's a popcorn fart. Angelico and Evans, they dance and twitch to the ring in their fluorescent green or whatever the fuck. And they do a bunch of flips and nobody, it, it, the people who, for the kind of people who like that kind of thing, they were all in the building, but seriously, Lucha boy or Lucha boy. Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy with Marco Stunt looked like the fucking cast of Land of the Lost, right? And I <laughs> wanted to, I badly wanted to skip this, but I had morbid curiosity and I'm glad that I watched it because when I saw Luchasaurus before he was in that fucking battle royal and if he is the only goofy gimmick, it ain't goofy. But when he was in a battle royal with a fucking legless guy and fucking people painted colors and goddamn small children and the fuck and little my little dog pockets and all that other stupidity and goofiness. He the goofy came all over him because he was wearing an unorthodox outfit. But if he's in with allegedly normal human beings, this fucking guy's huge. He's in shape. He looks like a badass under that mask. And we talked about Jungle Boy. I said, don't just present him as a star right now. Wait for the weekly TV and tell his story. JR used his his real name a couple of times, but that's as close as they got. But build the kid as an underdog is what my idea was if they wanted to make him a single. But now they've got this tag team. It's perfect because the kid has charisma. He's an athlete. He's just so small. But he can sell his ass off and he can come back and do the big things and he can do the big things off his partner and his partner's the cleanup guy. <clears throat> and old Luchasaurus can move too and was fucking agile and did some good shit. So the only outlaw they got on them was having the kid in their corner, which is just stupid. But it, it, as far as a match... The heels beat up the faces at first, and then every time somebody'd tag in, they'd start having a different match. It didn't mean anything from, from one entrant to the next. It had no flow to it. They just did things to each other. Um, it, it, like I said, it's too Grayson isn't bad. He's not real physically impressive. He, he did some good shit. But the fucking fat partner is just, it's embarrassing. And so then they got heat on Jungle Boy. And then they wasted the heat they had built up because there were simultaneous tags. And I used to have the tag fucking, the hot tag classes in OVW and Ring of Honor and everywhere I can. And, and nobody does it anymore. They don't teach it because they do this shit on WWF TV. So that's the way everybody thinks it's supposed to be that suddenly both partners will tag simultaneously. No, that's a cold tag. You've wasted your heat you've built. The heels tag first when the babyface creates an opportunity. 
Then the everybody's down. Then the heel makes the tag. <laughs> then the fresh heel comes at the baby face who has no way to get to his partner, but suddenly he leaps over, or ducks under, or does some Hail Mary, and he gets the fucking diving tag. That's a hot tag. This was just blah, start over again. But Luchasaurus was the star. They should keep him and Jungle Boy away from schlubs like these other teams and put them in with whoever the, their top teams are going to be because they should be one of them. But it it just... Then it it became Jack Evans and Angelico against Dark Order at one point, and all of it went to shit with just flips and nonsense, and it made no sense. And then Luchasaurus threw stunt onto another guy outside. Then Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy did a great double team, and it got a huge pop, and it wasn't the finish. And then they all got back in and they did a bunch of goofy shit. And then they beat Jungle Boy. Dark Order won the worst team on the roster that's gotten over like a fart in church so far. Beat the fucking... And, and, <sighs> I hate their entrance to it. All the... I don't know if they're supposed to be gimps or what What the whole... The little the the, the, cr the creepers, yeah. the minions, whatever the, the fuck. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't hear what he was saying on commentary because he was so low. Every time he said creepers, like, did he say free birds? I don't know why that's what I thought he was saying, but. But yeah. th th they're doing it because somebody's had an idea that this is somehow a fucking gimmick that will get these fucking schlubs over. Anyway, was, was that about your assessment, Mr. Last, of this the match? Uh, yes. I also wrote here in my notes, I don't know how you feel, but I thought the venue looked really cool and had a great yes. look. Yes, they had, I didn't even know it was going to be an outdoor show. It really did look cool. You know, I'm so uh, I'm so sick of like Raw and really everything that WWE does, and then it kind of follows through to so many other people where every show looks the same, no matter where you are, no matter how different each venue is. Every venue looks the same. Every town looks the same. Yeah, this looked unique, and I really liked it. That's what, what they dress the buildings up on the WWF shows where everything looks the same, no matter what arena you're in, and. It just, it, it, there's no personality anyway. The, so the, the arena, yes, was cool. And once again, the lighting, the production, oh, I, had, I had one other note here. Uh, okay. I agree with you. I really liked Luchasaurus and jungle boy. However, I'm going to have a little bit of criticism. It's for Luchasaurus. Although it's for a lot of other people, too many thigh slaps. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, if we, if we got that deep into the fucking criticism with this fucking sloppy crew, we'd never finish this show, but I agree there also. It was like one after another at one point. I was like, oh, come on. You know, you don't need to do that. We just saw you kick the guy in the fucking head. <laughs> uh, Kip Sabian and Adam Page. Here's a question for you. Why? Why do any of the boys do the allowing you to trade chops and forearms deal? These days, why do they all do that? I don't know. Here, you hit me, and then I'll hit you back, and you'll stand there while I hit you, and we'll just do that back. And that's fucking. St do you see that in the UFC? I can understand bowing up under a guy chopping you or punching you, and you bow up and hulk up and get the second lease on life, right? That that'll work. But just standing there, okay, you hit me. Now I'm gonna hit you, and we're gonna do this back and forth. It's fucking stupid. Uh, that's the first thing that I would have nipped in the bud in wrestling school. They probably want that fight forever chant. Well, they didn't get it. Now, how, having said that, everybody knows I'm a fan of Adam Page, the hangman. He looks great. He's got good size, but he's an, he's an old-time wrestler body where it's not all muscles, but he can obviously work, and he's got personality. It, here's what I noticed about Kip Sabian. I hate to keep saying he's a good athlete. You can say that about almost everybody, but Sa Kip Sabian... In this match, he came off as the same size, the same look, the same haircut, the same facial expression, and the same style of work as almost everybody else in the fucking ring these days. The weird haircut where you're shaved on the sides, thin athletic body, but no oomph, no facials. They do the same things. They all look 14 years old. He just, he does shit. I... <laughs> I mean, I did. It, there was he didn't do anything wrong. It just is more the same. It's funny. I thought about that the other day about how everyone wrestles the same way and does the same moves. I was watching a Tony Atlas match from I think 1982 in Mid South, and it got me thinking about a match on the Mid Atlantic tapes of Tony Atlas. I forget who he was wrestling, but no one says, "Oh, Tony Atlas, what a great worker." But you go back and watch those <laughs> yeah. matches. He got the fans into it, but he wrestled in such a different way. Like even his punches 
And the way he would do like his chops to the uh, trapezius area. Yes. Different than everyone else. Nowadays, everyone wrestles the same way. I hate to use Tony Atlas as the example here for, you know, wrestlers. Well, but the thing is, styles, Tony but... Atlas was not a great worker, but Tony Atlas was a great worker. Yeah. Because the, the modern definition of great worker is how well do you execute the moves and how many different ones do you do, which has nothing to do with being a great worker. Tony got the people into him. He did shit that only he did. And in a way, only he did it. And nobody else looked like that. And nobody else could connect like that with that passionate emotion. And that's why he was a huge baby face, an enormous star, especially in the Carolinas where he started and they grew up with him. Right. But um, if Adam Page's knee isn't really bad, he is one of the better sellers in the business. I worry about him every time I watch him. I know this is an ongoing knee thing, but goddamn, I, either it's bad or he's really good. Um, but the thing is, this match went on forever. I'd love to see Paige against Cody or Dustin or Jericho or MJF. It's just that this was... And then Paige did a moonsault off the top to the floor, too risky. For a guy, a top guy, especially against a middle card guy, what's he going to do against fucking Jericho? This was a common theme. As a matter of fact, then at that point, Page power bombs. You saw it went for the buckle bomb, but instead of the buckle bomb, he just threw Sabian backwards over the top rope, and Sabian landed flat of his back on the ramp. Yeah, and Sabian crawled back in and beat the count. And that's when I skipped ahead to find the finish because I was done. Because if the guy that's fixing to go for your world title takes 19 minutes to beat Kip Sabian, especially after he's thrown him over the top rope like a sack of shit on a, took a bump like that. And it, it, how long is it going to take him to beat Jericho? Three hours? What the, 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 they don't understand. It's not just about every match being the main event at Starcade 86. It's how do you build people? How do you get people over? They've got their stars going 20 minutes with middle card guys. And there's nothing wrong with being a middle card guy, but that's what Kip Sabian is. If they've got other plans, I'm afraid they're going to be shit out of luck. This match really lost me. And it's what you said before. I said at the top, the show went too long. The matches, like almost every match went too long. And this one may have been the biggest culprit because I, it just lost me. It lost my attention. It went way too long. Yeah. I, from whatever point that that buckle bomb over the top happened until the finish, that's where I skipped ahead because I, I was like, I'm disgusted now. Paige needs to beat this guy in the middle of the ring with his fucking finish, which he finally did. And then a minion, one of the creepers, attacks and lays out Adam Page and unmasks as Chris Jericho. And he, and he got Page hard way with that fucking, what's he called? The double knee thing? Oh, uh, I forget the... the ja, 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 ja. Code breaker. <laughs> code breaker. He, he bloused his eye and busted his eyebrow open with the code breaker, which if it hap happened, to, had to happen, was fortuitous because it looked fucking great. Not only as a move, but also you, you could see the fucking, you know, uh, uh, damage later on. So that was a great piece of business that they could have done after an eight-minute match where Adam Page beat young Kip Sabian. But they didn't. Um, next was SCU of Kazarian and Sky with Christopher Daniels against the Lucha Brothers, Pentagon, and Phoenix. And I had hopes for this <laughs> because I'm a big fan of Kazarian and Daniels and I've just seen Sky the time or two and he looks great too and I've seen Pentagon and Phoenix in MLW a couple of times and when they're against other luchadors I'm, I'm not saying the matches make any sense lucha matches don't make any sense in a traditional American pro wrestling sense but at least you they do what they do well right <laughs> This didn't work. It didn't work. It, 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 SCU are grown men that look like athletes and know how to work, which is refreshing. But one of the first things I hate, do you know the spot now that everybody's doing where they do the tackle and the other, the guy don't go down. So the other, it gives him another chance. So the guy that did the tackle turns around and hits the ropes again and comes back. Right. Yeah. But they don't do it the way guys used to do it. 
they do it now like they're in Cirque du Soleil. Now visualize this now that I'm bringing it up. I come off the ropes and I give you a tackle and you don't go down. I look at you and you say, I dare you to do it again. I then, while I'm only two feet away from you, I turn completely around and turn my back to you. I stand there for three or four seconds and with an exaggerated floor gymnastics routine hitching my step, <laughs> I take off and hit the ropes. If you turned your back on Dick Murdoch like that and you were two feet away from him, he would punch you in the base of the skull and knock you out. And that would be the end of the match because you're an idiot. And it, it, Bobby Eaton used was not only had one of the better shoulder tackles, he would steamroller you, but never hurt you. He brought everything he had with momentum and you'd never felt him. We used to do that fucking double knockout spot with me and him. It was fucking great, but he was so smooth at running the ropes and he had some weight behind him. When he would hit you with that tackle, you would take the bump to the side. And instead of stopping as guys used to do and then hitting the ropes to their right, Bobby would run straight on to the rope across that he was already running toward. And then the guy would drop down and he'd come off the other side because he had such momentum going. But you could always hit the tackle. The guy goes down, you stop, and then you go to your right. You hit the ropes to the right to come back off where he could either stand up and take another tackle or he might drop down or he might leapfrog or whatever. But it's not turning your back on your opponent. It's the stupidest fucking thing. And it's just one of those little things that just... it. it this is wrestling school shit. And I know they train them differently in Mexico. And I saw one of the, one of the Lucha brothers grabbed a right armed headlock. It's just, you'd be able to think they'd remember what country they're in, but Scorpio sky and Pentagon did a very long milk. The crowd bit and Pentagon takes his glove off and pitched it to the referee and she dropped it. So they did it again, <laughs> but then they finally started having a match. Uh, it, I the the long milking thing, uh, da, 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 but it, the people were into it. The Lucha Brothers did some nice double team stuff. They did some chops and super kicks. They milked the people. Then they they attacked Daniels. He freely fought back in front of the referee, but the referee then in turn kicked him out of ringside. She's good. Which was, I, and I was about to say, yeah, no. I, let me say it first, and then you can <laughs> follow it up. All right. I was skeptical, but this girl does a great job at refereeing and her facial expressions work and she's got the body language and she milks it and she seems concerned. She's doing a good job. Yeah, she's fantastic. I believe in her. Out of all the referees on that show, she's yeah. the one I don't want yelling at me. I believe in her. She's great. She has authority face, right? Instead of the guys that are just, they look like they're trying to hide from make sure they don't get potated. <laughs> anyway... Then, but here, then they got heat on Phoenix and it ground to a halt. And the, that's the problem with Lucha. Nobody wants to see anybody sell. You can't get heat. You, you can't get a set of heat and build a comeback. It just has to be moves. They did another set of simultaneous cold tags. There was nice action on the comeback. And then at one point, the Lucha brothers went to do a double team and Phoenix did a kick, and then was the guy, Pentagon was holding for something else, but Phoenix went to do a dive that he was supposed to do next, but he got lost, he stopped, and then he died, dove anyway. And then SCU, who I thought they had set up to be the heels, made a big comeback. And then they all did way too much and went way too long. And, then, and th these are my notes. There are no heels or baby faces. None of this makes sense. Nobody's tagging anymore. And then the Lucha Brothers won with something. I wanted to like that one, but it just, it didn't, it, it didn't work for me, dog. It didn't come together. I mean, I felt pretty much the same way. It went, another one went forever. And I just keep thinking, fucking get to it already. Like I'm <laughs> ready for the, now I'm ready for the main event. I don't even want to see anything else because everything is taking so fucking long. Same well, thing wait, <laughs> there's more <laughs> <clears throat> because next we get Shima against Kenny Olivier. Now I, it, and once again, full disclosure, in all honesty, I don't like this fucking simpering, mealy mouth twit from his entrance on. <laughs> and I can never take him seriously as a professional wrestler, much the same way as I never said anything good about Eddie Mansfield after March of 1985. I will never 
dignify Kenny Olivier with calling him a professional wrestler because of what he did. It's just, it's not going to happen. It's it, that was, that was even, that was even worse than exposing the business on the front page of fucking newspapers or on 2020, like Eddie Mansfield, it was exposing it and shitting on it and making a mockery of it at the same time. And everybody say, Oh, he was young. I was young too. Once I never did shit like that. I was taught to respect the business, not just be a clown and a joker. So, Apart from his goofy facials, Olivier didn't do anything in this match that I saw silly or phony. He's a great gymnast. Shima's a real good athlete, and he can work. Shima will never be a main event guy in the United States. I sincerely hope they're not planning that. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. So why did this fucking match go 22 fucking minutes? Because every, every match has to. Every match has to. How long is it going to take Olivier to beat Moxley? Three days? This It's stupid. <laughs> get your goddamn star out there and get him a fucking win and a decent match. Um, Once again, after 12 minutes, I believe I've jotted it down, 12 minutes, I started skipping ahead. How long is this going to go? How long is this going to go? I skipped ahead 10 minutes before Omega won with his wing dingy thingy. 22 minutes against a middle card guy for somebody that's supposedly their fucking big superstar, one of them. But they're great workers. We're trying to get a great match. Well, good. Get a great match with somebody that's going to sell you some fucking tickets like Jericho or Moxley or fucking Page. I'll tell you. If it, yeah, I'll, go ahead. Go I'll, ahead. I'll, I'll tell you another thing, though, Jim. And, you know, I've expressed what I thought. You've expressed what you thought. I wasn't in the room. I wasn't in the venue, so I can't speak for the crowd. But it seemed like on TV, and I did watch it on my TV, that they were feeling tired by this point, too, or they just stopped reacting to a lot of stuff. And even the commentators, it seemed like yes. they were losing steam as this show went on. Well, because the show was losing steam as it went on. Why does everything have to be so long? Why do these matches have to be so long? We'll come back to that. But here came the high spot. Here came the, the good point. Jericho comes out, Tony Khan, wrap him in bubble wrap, give him whatever he wants. He is not only the biggest name here for recognition, but besides for MJF, he's the only heel you got that I'm aware of. And he's the only, he's the biggest name to give anybody any rub. He did a great heel promo, Jack Offville, had to be hot in that outfit. He's taken credit for AEW and that's, and there's a grain of legitimacy there. And, and, he made fun of the stupid battle royal. He worked the crowd great. And then here comes Adam Page, and he's full of fucking piss and vinegar, and they have a goddamn pull apart. And here, finally, some wrestling excitement. And the only thing that I thought wrong with that was once they got him separated and Jericho was on the ramp, Page should have broke loose and dove out of that ring and tried to get him one more time just to show that he's fucking lost it. But there was some fucking wrestling on. Imagine pro wrestling broke out on this fucking cosplay program. Yeah, really good promo from Jericho. And again, going back to the Adam Page match, I'm watching it when he runs in there. I'm thinking, why didn't he just beat the guy in five minutes and then Jericho attacks him and then it leads to this instead of the 20 minute match? But good promo. Yes. Uh, then they they did a great package, which I did watch on the Rhodes Brothers and the Bucks and. They actually talked about the Bucks making fun of shit and making fun of them and made it kind of a shoot little package and set up, you know, that they were going to lose their temper with each other because there was ill feelings. I have no idea where Jake Snake Roberts and Tony Schiavone came from in that, pro in that package just out of nowhere to talk about the Roses and the Bucks. And Tony's <laughs> has Tony Schiavone ever worked with the young Bucks? He's talking about how great they are. I am not sure. I thought he was good in the package. I don't know why the fuck they would use Jake, who's been begging them for a job on social media. And let's just all remember, complete white trash. But, well, but, there he but is. I've, you know, but he's a major name in wrestling. So is Tony Schiavone. But, but what are they how, doing there? how were they applicable to this? I just, I don't know where, if you were going to get two people to comment. In this package, it just seemed an odd choice. Well, I mean, maybe they were there. Well, let me ask you this now that I'm thinking about it. How far is Tony, and, and if Jake still lives in Georgia, how far is that from Jacksonville? 
Um, well, Jackson, well, Jacksonville from Atlanta, let's see, would be 400 miles. Okay. It's even longer. I didn't realize it was that far away. Okay. Yeah. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure. I, Cause I've never, I don't know that I've ever done Atlanta to Jacksonville direct, but you know what? Um, maybe you would know. Cause that's what it I'm would, thinking. Maybe because they're in Georgia, they were close enough that they could film something last minute with them. Well, it wouldn't be 400 miles, but you know, you'd have to go all the way down through South Georgia and then Jacksonville is up in North Georgia and over on the right hand side. So it's 300 miles, whatever the fuck point is. I don't know why they were in that package anyway, but great package. Okay. Here comes the young bucks and the Rhodes brothers. And I want you people to know that at one point I have written down here, I'm going to write down this line. This is the best Young Bucks match I have ever seen. Wow. I was thrilled from the, that's what I wrote at one point. I was thrilled from the start. They locked up. You could tell that, that Matt and Nick actually were going to try to show people that they could work as well as do all the flippy stuff. And even when they locked up, there was a little extra oomph in it. And they're trying, even though Dustin and Cody are just so much bigger. And there is a size visual credibility issue, right? But uh, they were working. You could tell Cody and Dustin led them through this fucking thing where they, they did almost the impossible in that they got all of the Young Bucks stuff in. In the first 10 minutes of the match, they got all this stuff in, but it all made sense. So the Bucks got to do their shit, but it still made sense. People still sold shit. There was a wrestling match going on. Obviously, Cody and Dustin are controlling the fucking thing. They got heat on uh, uh, they worked at first like the Bucks were heels, right? Where they didn't they get the they got the heat on Dustin first. Yeah. And Dustin sells like a million dollars. And then they give Cody the tag. And they're about 12 minutes in, and Cody's making this big ass comeback. And I'm thinking, they've done it. The Young Bucks have had a great wrestling match. They've done their flippy shit, but it still all made sense. Cody and Dustin are magicians. This is fucking fabulous. And then Cody finishes his comeback and they don't win and the match is not over and then everything settles down and they start over. And the people were up. And then they go into a second set of heat, but this time they get heat on one of the Bucks. And now they're suddenly kind of working as heels, but not really, but they get heat on the Bucks so the Bucks can get a tag. And then the fucking... Bucks make a comeback and then they all start doing shit to each other. And then it goes on and on. This match went over 30 fucking minutes. And they had, they literally had three matches. They had the first match where they got heat on dust and Cody made a comeback. They could have done a finish there and it would have been perfect. Then they started over again. They did another match where they got heat on one of the bucks and it blah, blah, blah. And then they could have finished and it'd been okay. It'd been fine if we hadn't had the real good match in front of it. And then they all just kept doing shit to each other until it looked like that they were lost and blown up. And at one point I saw a camera pan when they're all laying on the ground and every single one of them was look plainly looking at and talking to each other with mouths moving because they were trying to figure out where the fuck they were at at this point because they'd gone half an hour and they were just doing shit over and over. So eh, half a fucking hour. Don't, if, if you don't have a clearly defined baby face to clearly defined heel, you know, I've never seen two sets of heat in the same match where one team got a set of heat on the other team. And then the other team got a set of heat on that team. I've seen two sets of heat where we get Robert, give Ricky a tag, then get Ricky, give Robert a tag. But it was just it it just it it had to go so long and broke down into such a mess that even the Rhodes boys couldn't save it. And I don't know why they had to go. And then they were doing a promo afterwards, and the Bucks go into their blase promo where I don't know what they were gonna say. They were swerving like they were gonna fucking knock the Rhodeses, but they were probably gonna make up. But then suddenly the music interrupts them and they say, Well, I guess we're out of time. And then here comes fucking Shad Khan and the fucking gun violence guy. And here comes Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy and Brandy's out. 
And here comes Olivier, Kenny Olivier, the big fucking superstar, after that goddamn marathon match he had, comes out in a pair of shorts and some lime green shoes looking like a fucking gas station attendant. And they all just, it's like now the show is over and now it's the curtain call after the show where all of the community repertory players come out and thank the audience for being wonderful while they attended the play. And Cody, after he's had this fight for 30 minutes, does what the best promo I've ever seen him do with the most fire, talking about the goddamn a charity and then talking to putting AEW over after he's just fought for 30 minutes and he's not showing one sign of wear. And all of the people who have just fought each other are standing there. They're like, eh, you know, the show's over. So, we, you know, and whatever we were going to say, we didn't get it out. Never mind. And there's no ill feelings. And then they give fucking Olivier the microphone. And did you understand what in the fuck he was trying to say? Or is he on some kind of Japanese drugs we're not aware of? I was out by that point, but I've always thought he's awful on the mic. But he, and I guess, and here's the thing. He's, apparently his fucking sign off is good luck or goodbye and good night. And he goes, bang. Well, now they're fucking doing a charity show for victims of gun violence. So instead of, <laughs> instead of saying bang, he had to say boing. But he took forever to say, he sounds, he sounds just so wimpy and so unconvincingly tough, not tough. And so unpassionate and just nerdy. And he said a bunch of fucking words that didn't make any sense altogether, trying to explain why he was changing his catchphrase that I didn't know what the fuck it was to begin with. And then it fell flattered and goddamn a plate full of piss. And then they were off the air. So in this one, they didn't, I didn't see the pre-show and when, I'm sure the librarians or Sonny Kiss took care of this, but they didn't do anything blatantly stupid, silly, or obviously phony on their regular show. And there is some talent there, but it's, it's disguised in such a whirling dervish of three ways and four ways and interchangeable tag team matches and fucking bullshit and questionable talent decisions with using guys that just because they're friends and they get over on the fucking indies, I guess, because I don't know a single talent scout or agent or person that I worked with in the WWF or, or in any major company that would have legitimately signed at least half a dozen of these fucking people. Unless now they're saying, Oh, they're great because they want to get a fucking paycheck, but not at any point that I ever worked for a major company would at least half a dozen of the fuckers on this show be on this show. And not just my opinion. I'm sure now a lot of people are saying they're great because the, maybe the Tony Khan likes them and, and the people saying they're great want a fucking job, but no, would have never fucking happened right now. I saw half a dozen people on the MLW show last weekend for last that could have taken a half a dozen of these people's fucking place. And it would have been a lot goddamn better. And as I mentioned, if they wanted a tag team, there's the dynasty, there's the Briscoe brothers, there's the fucking revival Buy somebody out of their fucking contract. Instead of foisting off the fat guy and his fucking friend with no mask and a bunch of fucking skinniness. Where was old Mark Queen of Private Party? I'd like to see some more of him. Oh, they were in the crowd. You didn't see that? They showed a few people. What? They showed a few people in the crowd, luminaries in the crowd, including whoever the two lawyers were that sponsored the thing. They showed them drinking beer in the crowd. And then well, they, they, showed... they've just, that, that law firm is apparently in the victim, or not the victims, but apparently found guilty of some impropriety as it was on the internet here not long ago. But go ahead. But Private Party were at the end of the list of, of pseudo luminaries in the crowd. Private Party were sitting there in the crowd scouting, watching the other teams to, I guess, prepare for their next match. But well, ringside or in the crowd? Just I, I think I think it was ringside. I think it was okay. Ringside. Well, they, I, when you said they were just sitting out in the crowd, I'm like, what the fuck? Whenever I go to see the fucking Stones, I always run into Ron Wood in the fucking bleachers watching the opening <laughs> act. You know, I. Anyway, we've gone on too long already. But they much like fight for the much Paul. like that fucking show. Please, goddamn, I'm too old to watch any more of these shows. I'm, I don't have that much life left. Um. Guys, you're getting better. You didn't do anything stupid, silly, goofy, or overly phony. 
a lot of it was ill-advised, but at least everybody was working hard and serious. Some people just can't work. The production is incredible. There is talent on the card. There's a lot of shit in the way of the talent. And I'm trying to figure out if this is one of those deals where there's one, one guy booking this shit. There can't be because the booking is schizophrenic. So I think it's a, a lot of people booking this shit and it shows. Yeah. I think there's at least three different people, maybe four. There might be their problem. Yeah. You know, find one person and for good or bad, go with him because then your shit will make sense from start to finish. It is these writing teams and booking committees and creative teams. It's all bullshit, especially when you're starting from scratch. It needs to come from one guy's head. Well, I think what it is, and I could be wrong, uh, but I believe what it is, like, for instance, the Young Bucks are booking the tag team division. Oh, good. And boy. Cody's in charge of the singles division. And oh. I don't know how true it is. Someone told me Omega was in charge of the female division. So I, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a joke there or anything. I, someone legitimately told me that. I don't know how true that is. But when I say three or four people, at least, that's why I say that. Well, I it, it would. Did Dusty say, hey, JJ, you booked the tag teams. I just take care of the singles. No. No. What the fuck? There needs to be one guy with a lot more experience that apparently is being fucking applied here. And it needs to all come from him. I don't know who that guy would be. But, you know, anyway, this they've got to focus and they got to start getting their guys over or I mean, nobody's going to get over on these shows that ain't already over because the only people watching these shows are the people that already want all elite wrestling to succeed and like the Young Bucks, etc. For them to get someone over to any new audience. They have to change their tune and they have to realize that some guys' jobs are just there to get their ass whooped. And you need to concentrate on your stars and people that are marketable in this country, especially, and to a mainstream audience instead of the the group. And once again, I've heard a bunch of people on the internet. Well, if you studied up on the no, I'm not gonna fucking study up. I'm gonna watch the television program and or pay-per-view from this company first to know who these people are. And if I get interested in them, then I'm going to read the program. And then I might want to read the wrestling magazine, except there aren't any wrestling magazines anymore. Um, but you, you don't, you, you can't expect a guy who hadn't watched wrestling in 10 or 15 years because he's disgusted with it or a person that's never watched wrestling at all to just, Start studying. Hey, I better do my homework. There's a big fucking all elite pay-per-view on. I got to spend a couple hours on the internet trying to figure out who everybody is. What the fuck? You watch Mid-South Wrestling. If you've never seen it before, you'll instantly know why anyone is feuding with someone else, what the angles are, what the programs are. You'll know what's going on. It'll be exciting. Who the baby face is, who the heel is. Yeah. Even though the heel has a, he has somewhat of a bitch, but he's taking it too far. Can you imagine? How do I uh, find out what's going on here? Oh, you got to watch like the last year of TVs and then it'll take you here. You have yeah. to research. Get, get the fuck out of here. The problem too is the show went so long, the matches went so long that there's very few people I came out of that show wanting to see more of. I'm yeah. curious what they're going to do with Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy, hopefully without Marco's stunt. I obviously want to see whatever they do with MJF. Hopefully we can get him doing something without a bunch of other like a six man or a four, whatever they do with him. It's just give him a one-on-one. -on -one well, just, uh, just quit putting him in with the fucking preliminary guys and risking his health for no apparent reason. And a fucking preliminary match with a bunch of fucking job guys. But you know, and I'm sorry. And I, I know a lot of people really like him, but that Adam page match, I, I hope I never see another 20 minute Adam page match for the rest of my life. That really took me out of that match. And it, a lot it, of the it, show, it, it, it was not a good decision. And that's, and that's, see, that's the thing. I'm predisposed to like Adam Page. So I'd like to see him against anybody else. But once again, if it takes fucking Adam Page that long to beat a middle card guy, what's, how long is it going to take him to win the title against Jericho? Three fucking days. Or is he? Or, or does that just mean that Jericho's got an easy victory? And I, therefore, the curiosity. Because everybody's already going to think, I would assume, that Chris Jericho would beat Adam Page just because of ranking and name recognition. Maybe they'll surprise us. 
But now it really would be a surprise if a guy took 20 minutes to beat Kip Sabian, beats Chris Jericho, and especially in less time. Does that make any sense? And I know there's a bunch of cosplay wrestling fans out there going, well, well, this isn't real. They're just putting on a performance. That's the problem, you motherfuckers. I don't know whether to blame the fans or the fucking wrestlers. The fans who think that, and it's so fucking stupid, or the wrestlers who have pretty much enabled the fans to think that because they think the same thing. And they're even stupider because at least the fans ain't risking their goddamn health and welfare to put on a performance. But that's the problem when you don't have, and I'm not going to make this blanket statement and then I'm wrapping up. When you don't have competent fucking wrestling schools anymore that teach, teach people respect for the business as well as how you work with other people at their different levels. And you just got schools that teach moves and everybody wants to do each other shit to get each other over. And that's what you get. You're playing in the fucking deep end of the pool, boys. It's time to grow up, kick off your indie diapers, and let's see if we can hang with the fucking big dogs. If you can't, then stay on the porch. That's just my advice. Do you have any closing thoughts about this event? No. Are we going to do, uh, what is it, I'm out? All out? Is that what it is? What, are we going to do that? When is that? Uh, Labor Day? Well, I may not have anything else to do then, because on Labor Day, nobody works. What so, are you looking for? Based on what I just said before, how very little coming out of the show that I want to see more of. Like, even the roads. You know, Cody kind of won me over on the previous two shows. Because of that match just being endless, I just, I was sick of everyone by the end of it. Even though I kind of want to see more yeah. Dustin. But coming out of that show, which guys on that roster, or girls... Uh, do you want to see more of? Who has you intrigued? Well, obviously MJF. He's my favorite wrestler. Um, you know, Darby Allen, like, there's something there. It just, I just, I, I just have a problem because it's legitimate. <laughs> now, usually I like the legitimate gimmicks, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. he's legitimately a fucking idiot. But anyway, there's something there. Um, Spears, if he ever got a chance to do anything to fucking, you know, he, he got over by crowning Cody with the fucking chair and everybody uh, slandered him because he fucking potatoed him. It was fortuitous juice. Um, you know, the, like I said, Britt Baker, I think she's, and I'd love to see more awesome calm. I, I Kong, awesome, calm, awesome Kong. I saw she was out there. She's still there, but, uh, I, you know, girl wrestling ain't gonna do it for me really regardless I, that. The, the the Charlotte and Becky and the, the WrestleMania stuff, that was about as good as girl wrestling is going to be, and I don't see anybody here topping that. Um, the the Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy without the fucking kid, I'd like to see them, and I think they could do some business. Um, Adam Page, I want to see against Cody or Jericho or Moxley or somebody where they can have a wrestling match and, you know... Uh, um... Uh, you know, I, I I wanted to scream from the rooftops how great Cody and Dustin were that they had a great wrestling match that made sense with the Young Bucks, but then it went fucking twice as long and had three different matches. So there wasn't anything offensive as as like the Battle Royal or the Librarians thing that I saw on this. You know, there there but there but there wasn't anything as good as Cody and Dustin. So it's kind of in the middle for me, dog. Dog. All right. Randy Jackson <laughs> and, and well, and Jericho and Jericho's a big star and everybody knows it. I know you have had your, but it's, he looks a whole lot better to you now in this environment, doesn't he? Well, no, I mean, I think physically he still needs to get into better shape and take this a little more seriously that way. But in terms of his promo, I think it's, I was more intrigued by that promo than most promos I've seen from him in a long time. And I thought having the blood on his hands was really cool. I like his promo better than I probably like his matches right now, to be quite honest. When he and Lance Storm were sitting in 1994, sitting at Brian Hildebrand's kitchen table in his apartment over there, trying to cut a promo for me on an eight millimeter camcorder, and neither one could say Suey if the hogs had him, I never dreamed that he would be that good. But he has he is has been for quite a while now. But you would have never thought it from the the early stuff. Anyway, speaking of early, it's getting late. I don't know. I guess we're going to do a drive through this weekend. I ain't planning on leaving town. And I don't know what we're going to talk about next week because I don't know who is going to do anything stupid yet. But we'll keep you posted and you'll be the first to know. Uh, in, until then, 
in the meantime and in between times thank you fuck you and from me and brian bye-bye everybody <laughs>